everyone i hope i'm clearly visible audible can someone write in the chat box if i'm clearly visible and audible you can see my ppt also can we go ahead are you people there so i welcome you all for today's session i welcome you all for today's session and uh, very very good afternoon to all of you i am dr priyanka sachdev here and today for fmg students exclusively i am taking the session so this session is regarding pathology so in the next three hours i am going to give you entire overview of the pathology so we will discuss most important topics of the pathology so i will try to cover 50 60 topics in the next three hours okay so it will be in the form of the questions we will discuss the questions and answers in the answers i will not discuss only the particular answer of that question i will discuss that particular topic i guess most of the students know my way of teaching so in this way we are going to cover a overlook of the pathology now in the pathology this session i try to take all the pyq topics of fmg students all the previous year questions are going to be covered here i mean the topics and i'm damn sure if you are attending this session attentively for the next 3 hours with me most of the questions in your exam will be from these topics only i assure you that okay so without wasting any further time let me start can we start ahead so let's start fmg pathology pyq discussion question number 1 it is in front of you can i read the question i will read the question i will read the options i will tell you what is the approach and i will teach you that topic completely so that if any other question coming from the same topic you will be able to answer that so can i start so let me start there is a 40 year old female so in the questions now you have to take all the clues age is always a clue the gender is always a clue okay there is a 40 year old female having a history of bee allergy the patient is having a allergy maybe any allergy it is bee allergy doesn't matter but it is a allergy you know so allergy is type 1 hypersensitivity i i guess most of the students know that okay allergy is type 1 hypersensitivity came to the emergency room with the complaints of swelling of the face dyspnea after the bee sting so the patient have swelling of the face and the patient have the dyspnea right patient have the dyspnea okay so these are the symptoms of the allergy the patient is having now the question is regarding which of the following inflammatory mediator play a important major role in this mechanism so basically examiner want to know whether you know the type 1 hypersensitivity mechanism yes or no if you know type 1 hypersensitivity mechanism you can answer this question very easily you can answer this question very easily let me tell you the options the options are serotonin bradykinin histamine and prostaglandin these are the four options in front of you so let me tell you the correct answer i guess most of the students can guess the correct answer is histamine so to understand i will come on the question again to understand this i will explain you hypersensitivity completely here i am going to explain you type 1 hypersensitivity okay first before coming on the topic you tell me what is hypersensitivity what is hypersensitivity then we will see the types of the hypersensitivity now definitely in your exam you are going to get one question on, on hypersensitivity whether it is on type 1 type 2 whether it is on type 3 or type 4 there are four types of hypersensitivity i don't know that but definitely you will get one question on hypersensitivity now basically in all four types of hypersensitivity you have to see their pathogenesis number 1 and you have to see its example number 2 pathogenesis and example both you have to see one by one okay Okay. hypersensitivity pathogenesis and hypersensitivity examples you have to see okay so uh, before coming on that let me tell you what is hypersensitivity hota kya hai hypersensitivity ka meaning kya hai okay before understanding that you tell me what is immunity if you understand immunity then only you can understand hypersensitivity can you understand immunity what is immunity just a second what is immunity uh immunity is a defense mechanism in human body it is the defense defense mechanism in human body against the foreign particle whenever any foreign particle enters human body the body show immunity for that that is a defense so my next question to you is immunity good for humans or it is bad for humans it is a defense mechanism so whenever any foreign particle whether it is a bacteria virus fungus or parasite it is entering human body so it is the immunity which is taking care of it it is good or bad so of course most of the students will say it is good but let me tell you something when immunity is excessive it is excessive it is too much it is excessive of the immunity you know excessive the, so instead of killing only foreign it start killing the host also it cause damaging the host also and that is known as hypersensitivity so what is hypersensitivity hypersensitivity is just excessive immunity excessive activation of the immune system okay there are four types of hypersensitivity type 1 2 3 4 so currently this question is based on type 1 so what are the examples of type 1 in type 1 all the allergies will come 
how many allergies you know so i guess being a medical student you know most of the allergy if i say eczema you know it is a skin allergy if i say hay fever you can understand it is a respiratory allergy asthma urticaria anaphylactic shock acute dermatitis these all are allergies no need to learn so these are the examples of type 1 hypersensitivity where you will get confused in your exam exam mein confusion kaha hoga so you will get a confusion in the named reaction there are certain named reaction of type 1 hypersensitivity where you can get confusion okay so what are the named reaction it's theobald smith phenomenon it's putzner kutzner reaction pk reaction kasoni test hai na and schulz dale phenomenon these are four named reaction we will make a mnemonic for that so what is a mnemonic so i can say in type 1 hypersensitivity all the allergies come no need to learn the mnemonic for allergy i guess everyone knows eczema asthma urticaria these are the allergies apart from that you have to learn a mnemonic pcts have you heard proximal convoluted tubules pcts learn like that proximal convoluted tubules so p stands for putzner kutzner reaction c stands for kasoni test T stands for Theobald Smith phenomenon and S stands for Schulz Dale phenomenon. I will explain you what is Schulz Dale phenomenon. So these are the examples of type one hypersensitivity. Let me tell you the examples of type two hypersensitivity. These are the examples of type one. Okay. The mnemonic is proximal convoluted tubules PCTS. Learn the named reaction. You frequently get question on that. Right. There are PVQs on that. PVQs on all four. You will find in FMG exam. Coming on type two hypersensitivity. The mnemonic is my blood group is Rh positive. So this is a mnemonic. Okay, my blood group is Rh positive. This is a mnemonic. So here M stands for myasthenia gravis. Okay, B stands for blood transfusion reaction. G stands for good pasture syndrome and Graves disease. I stands for ITP. You know, immune thrombocytopenic purpura. R stands for rheumatic fever. H stands for hyperacute graft rejection. And P stands for pernicious anemia and pampigus vulgaris. So these are the examples of type 2 hypersensitivity. Frequently on all of them, there is frequently question on myasthenia gravis. Blood transfusion reaction includes all type of blood transfusion uh, reaction like ABO incompatibility as well as RH incompatibility. By RH incompatibility, I mean erythroblastosis fatalis which is also an example of type 2. Okay, because it is RH incompatibility. Coming on examples of type 3. Type 3 hypersensitivity examples we will deal. So the mnemonic is SHARP. S-H-A-R-P. The mnemonic is SHARP. S stands for Triple S. There are three examples. Triple S. Serum sickness, sheet test, SLE. Serum sickness, sheet test, SLE. H stands for HS purpura. A stands for arthritis reaction. R stands for reactive arthritis. And P stands for very two important disease, PON. Polyarthritis nodosa and PSGN post tropical glomerulonephritis. So please try to learn the examples. If you try to learn all the examples, you will be unable to mug it up. But with the help of the mnemonic, it will be easy. Coming on last type 4 hypersensitivity. For type 4 hypersensitivity, we have a mnemonic. Again, the mnemonic is John. John gave two lip popcorn to Hershey. So John stands for John Mote reaction. Two lip tuberculin lipramin. Tuberculin reaction, lipramin reaction. Popcorn. P stands for pernicious anemia. And con ka C stands for contact dermatitis. Hershey is Hershimoto thyroiditis. Okay, so these are the examples of type 4 hypersensitivity. So this is the summary in front of you. You can see all four type of hypersensitivity with their example. You have to write all the four mnemonics at one place. We will try to write. Would you like to help me? Type 1 hypersensitivity, type 2 hypersensitivity, type 3 hypersensitivity, type 4 hypersensitivity. Okay, these are the four types of hypersensitivity I am writing. So what are the examples? Type 1 includes all allergies. Don't learn the allergies, you already know that. Plus PCTS, I guess you know the full form. Type 2 include my blood group is RH positive. That is type 2. What is type 3? Type 3 include the mnemonic SHARP. S-H-A-R-P. SHARP is the mnemonic. Type 3. And type 4 include John gave tulip. Tulip and popcorn. To Hershey. Now, if I say the full form, it will take time. I assume most of the students will learn the full form. You have to learn all these full forms. Okay. So that is type 1, 2, 3, 4 hypersensitivity. Now, currently our question was on mechanism of type 1. Frequently you get questions on the example. Now, the question will be of two type. Either they will give you one of the disease and they will ask you the type of hypersensitivity. For example, they will ask Kasoni test as an example of rheumatic fever is, an, is a type of good pasture, myasthenia gravis, whatever. It is a type of which hypersensitivity? The four options are type 1, 2, 3, 4 either or else opposite they will give you the name of the 
uh, hyper sensitivity like type 1 which of the following is an example of type 1 which of the following is an example of type 2 like that so if you know the mnemonics you can answer that now the question was based on the mechanism of type 1 so we will discuss the mechanism i would like to draw the mechanism let me tell you what is the mechanism of type 1 hypersensitivity so here the allergen as soon as any allergen enters in human body the allergen is the antigen as soon as any allergen enters human body the first cell to which it comes in contact is antigen presenting cell the first cell is the antigen presenting cell so antigen presenting cell what does it do it will engulf the antigen degrade the antigen into multiple pieces process the antigen it will process the antigen and uh, present it uh, to the next cell present it to the cell which cell it will present to helper th2 cell so the next cell in the row is helper th2 cell so it will activate helper TH2, not helper TH1. It is helper TH2 cell. Helper TH2 cell will get activated. On activating, it will secrete certain cytokines from it. The cytokines are interleukin-3, interleukin-4, interleukin-5, like that. Interleukin-4 is very important. It will activate the next cell, which is the next cell here. The next cell here is the B lymphocyte. The B lymphocyte get activated. The B lymphocyte will get converted into the next cell. It is plasma cell. Plasma cell form antibodies. You know, so here antibodies are formed. Let me form the antibodies. These are the antibodies. Now, there are five types of antibodies. IgG, IgA, IgM, IgD, IgE. So, which one is forming here in type 1 hypersensitivity? I guess everyone knows IgE is formed. It's very important PYQ. IgE is formed here. So, what does this IgE do? This IgE will go in blood. And in the blood, it will go to the mast cell. This is the mast cell. The next cell is the mast cell. And this IgE antibody will bind on the surface of the mast cell like this. With the help of its FC receptor. You know, FC. FC receptor with the help of its FC receptor it will bind on the surface of the mast cell like that right now it will remain there forever this is known as sensitization this is known as sensitization and this event is over so I mean to say that when the allergen enters first time nothing happens only sensitization happens and the person is all right but when the same allergen enters second and subsequent time sub second time third time fourth time fifth time second and subsequent time so what does it do this time the complete process is not again repeated no 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 body have a memory i mean to say body have a immunological memory so the body will recognize you are the same antigen for which we have done the process in the past so you directly go to your antibody you directly go to your antibody we have make an antibody for you it is present on the surface of the mast cell and you directly divert it towards that so this allergen will go to its antibody and bind on the surface of the antibody like this okay as soon as this allergen bind on the surface of the antibody uh, it will give signal to the mast cell on receiving the signal the mast cell will burst yes i repeat the mast cell will burst when the mast cell will burst inside the mast cell granules are present so granules will come out this step is known as degranulation what is it known as degranulation of mast cell and the granules contain many important substrate inside that it contains histamine which is our question right now the most important is histamine it contains histamine serotonin leukotriene prostaglandin platelet activating factor you know so all these will cause the symptoms of the allergy they will cause the vasoconstriction they will cause increased vascular permeability vasodilatation increased secretion from the glands so you know during allergy we, the face turns red the body have vasodilatation there is edema due to the increased vascular permeability increased secretion from the glands like the lacrimal glands nasal glands you know so these are the symptoms of the allergy are due to this and every time when the allergen is entering the same thing is happening so this is the mechanism of type 1 hypersensitivity i hope everyone got it yes or no so whenever the antigen is entering first time it is going to antigen presenting cell antigen presenting cell is degrading it and presenting it to helper th2 cell helper th2 cell uh, get activated and they secrete cytokines interleukin 3 4 5 interleukin 4 activating b lymphocyte b lymphocyte convert into plasma cell plasma cell form ig antibody ig antibody go to the mast cell they will bind on the surface of the mast cell and this is known as sensitization. Now, when the same antigen enters second time, it will directly go to its Ig antibody which are present on the mast cell. Mast cell get activated, it will receive the signal, it will burst and degranulation takes place. During degranulation, the same mechanism, the same diagram is drawn which I have told you, right? This is the same diagram drawn here. Okay, you can see. So, what is happening here now? Uh, all the uh, degranulation you can see this is the bursting of the mast cell when this antigen is binding the mast cell is bursting and you can see the granules are coming out can you see these granules these granules cause the hypersensitivity one of them is histamine that was our question so coming on the next question when stained with congo red okay and visualized under polarized microscope following substance show apple green color is it lipid is it amyloid? Is it collagen? Or is it calcium? Can you guess what is the correct answer? Yes. 
the correct answer here is the amyloid the correct answer here is the amyloid actually amyloid so what are the clues given to you on congo red staining and in polarized light the amyloid shows apple green color now it is not necessary the same question will come in the exam you will definitely get a question on the amyloid amyloidosis or amyloid is a very very ultra important topic so it's time to cover amyloid completely we will see everything of the amyloid not only this question so let's start the disease amyloidosis so I'm very sure most of the students even don't know what is amyloidosis, which organ disease it is. It is a multi-organ disease. Let me tell you, amyloid, amyloid is an abnormal protein. So humans have many types of proteins in their blood like albumin, globulin, you know, many proteins are there. But amyloid is an abnormal protein. It is not present in healthy individual. So what is the abnormality in that? The abnormality, the abnormality is in the secondary structure. Proteins have three structure, na? primary, secondary, tertiary. So the abnormality is in the secondary structure of this protein which make it insoluble. So this protein is basically insoluble. This is the abnormality. Amyloid is the abnormal protein. It is formed only in few persons which have the disease amyloidosis. It is not formed in healthy individual. And it is having some problem in its secondary structure. That's why this protein is insoluble. So if it is insoluble, insoluble what it will do? What it will do? So let me draw a blood vessel. Inside the blood vessel, this is the protein. This is amyloid protein. I told you it is insoluble, na? So what it will do, this is the tissue. This is the tissue, I mean to say this is the organ. It is any organ. It can be liver, it can be kidney, it can be heart, it can be brain, any human organ. So what does amyloid will do? Since it is insoluble, it will come out of the blood and get deposited here in the tissues, multiple tissues. That's why I'm saying amyloid is a multi-organ system. It deposited in the tissue extracellularly. If you can see here, I have deposited extracellularly. I am not depositing intracellularly. By depositing extracellularly, it will compress the cells. And by compressing, the cells will fail, the organ will fail. There is a cellular failure, organ failure. So this is the disease amyloidosis in which an abnormal protein is formed which is known as amyloid. So please understand amyloid completely. Okay. Same thing is written in front of you. What is amyloidosis? In amyloidosis, it's a disease in which an abnormal protein is formed, which is known as abnormal protein, amyloid protein. It is insoluble. It deposited extracellularly in various cells and organs and caused their failure. Right. There is some problem in the secondary structure of this protein, which make it insoluble. Okay. That is amyloidosis. Here you can see a diagram of brain. This is normal brain. This is Alzheimer's brain. You know, Alzheimer's disease is a risk factor or a trigger factor for amyloidosis. So Alzheimer's patients frequently have amyloidosis. Which type? I will tell you. See the normal brain. I guess you can see the two diagram. In the normal brain, you can see the neurons. These are the neurons you can see well. Okay. And see extracellularly. Only extracellular matrix is present, nothing abnormal. But here in the extracellular matrix, can you see some deposits, the brownish deposit extracellularly, right? This is amyloid plaque. Okay, so you can understand how does it deposited amyloid um, extracellularly. Now it's time to understand the physical and chemical nature of the amyloid. Then we will see the staining. Okay, what is the physical nature of the amyloid? What is the physical nature of the amyloid? What is the physical nature? Yes, I'm asking. Can you please tell me physical nature of the amyloid? In the physical nature uh, of the amyloid, I would like to discuss two, two modalities, uh, electron microscopy and x-ray crystallography. How does it look on electron microscopy? Can you please tell me? And how does it look on x-ray crystallography or infrared spectrometry? How does it look? So on electron microscopy, there are non-branching fibrils. Can you see the long, long non-branching fibrils? The long non-branching fibrils. The long non-branching fibrils are there. The diameter of them. The diameter of them is 7.5 to 10 nanometer and the length is indefinite. So these are the long fibrils. These are long, number one. These are non-branching, number two. Their length is indefinite and their diameter is 7.5 to 10 nanometer. Please learn the diameter. I'm talking about this diameter. The diameter is 7.5 to 10 and the length is indefinite. This is the structure in the form of the fibril. Say the word fibril, filament or fibril. Okay. But on X-ray crystallography, it is not fibril. It is in the form of beta pleated sheet structure. Can you see? It's beta pleated sheet structure. It's like beta sheeted uh, uh, sheet structure. Okay, now I'm coming on chemical nature of amyloid. Chemical nature. So in the chemical nature, we will discuss three things. What are the three things we are going to discuss? There are three important, I mean, two are very important, AL and AA type of amyloid. And in others, there are many amyloid, I will discuss them. Okay, so AL and AA, I'm going to discuss in detail. The two main type of amyloid, AL, AA. Okay, what is AL? What is the full form of AL? What is the full form of AA? Does anyone know? What is AL? It's amyloid light chain. That is AL. And what is AA? It's amyloid associated. That is known as AA. So there are two main type AL and AA. So let me tell you the two in detail. 
right in others also we have a list we have a list so in that list a beta 2 microglobulin is there the trigger is hemodialysis attr what is the full form of attr a is amyloid ttr is transthyrin what is ttr transthyrin can you say it with me transthyrin it's t t r okay it is seen in senile cardiomegaly and familial amyloid polyneuropathies the next is a beta now don't get confused a beta to microglobulin is different and a beta is different the trigger for both of them is different the trigger for a beta is alzheimer's disease i have shown you the image of the alzheimer now so in alzheimer's disease a beta is common so you have to learn these three very clearly these four or these three very clearly apart from that prion disease is there calcitonin is there you know islet amyloid polypeptide is there so many others are there but not very important so which are the important you have to tell me which one are the important the most important is al then aa then in others i told you a beta i told you a beta to microglobulin a beta a beta to microglobulin and one more i told you attr right so first try to say their full form okay then tell me the trigger so it's a a a a a a is always amyloid here amyloid light chain here amyloid associated here amyloid beta here amyloid beta to microglobulin and here amyloid transthyrin now tell me their trigger you have to tell me the trigger the disease in which this type of amyloid is common so al is common in multiple myeloma okay aa is common in all chronic disease any chronic inflammation or chronic disease any chronic like tb rheumatoid arthritis anyone will work a beta is common in alzheimer i told you in alzheimer's disease okay a beta to microglobulin the patient is on dialysis if any patient is on dialysis if both kidneys are failed renal failure bilateral renal failure is there for years and years so in case of dialysis the patient is on dialysis this one is common and attr is common in senile cardiomyopathy senile cardiomyopathy senile cardiomyopathy and polyneuropathies so please learn the trigger i'm damn sure you will get many questions on these you have to understand the type of the amyloids so we have seen the physical nature we have seen the chemical nature now it's time to see the diagnosis of amyloidosis how to diagnose amyloid how to diagnose the amyloid can you please tell me how do we do the diagnosis of amyloid we do the diagnosis of amyloid with the help of biopsy there is no blood test for amyloid we have to do the biopsy we have to do the biopsy so we will do a biopsy what is the site of the biopsy the site of the biopsy is either rectum or abdominal fat pad either it's rectum or abdominal these are the best site now i told you amyloidosis is a disease in which multiple organs are involved it's a multi organ failure so multiple organs are involved there so tell me the site uh, from where you can take the biopsy so we will take the biopsy either from rectum or we will take it from abdominal fat pad either from the rectum or you can see this is abdominal fat pad now what we will do in the biopsy in the biopsy in the biopsy we can use the five stains right so i was telling you there the five type of the stains in the amyloid on whichever question is there the first stain is hne in hne the color of the amyloid is pink the second stain is methyl violet or crystal violet here the color of the amyloid is rose pink the third stain is the congo red congo red here here two options are there whether you are doing light microscopy or polarized light you are using visible light or polarized light if you are using visible light the color is pink and if you are using the polarized light the color is apple green the next is the thioflavin like the fluorescent fluorescent dyes thio, thioflavin t thioflavin s so here we use uv light and here we see the fluorescent color and last we can use specific immunohistochemistry right on hne i told you you see the diagrams of all five one by one on hne i told you it's pink in color it's extracellular homogeneous pink in color you can see this is pink in color right on metachromatic stains rosalyn dyes methyl violet crystal violet it is rose pink in color can you see the the pink color here the pink color is the amyloid it is a diagram of a kidney you can see the glomerulus you can see the amyloid is depositing extracellularly around the capillaries okay here also you can see the pink color extracellular around the blood vessel it is getting deposited right on congo red there are two option whether you are using visible light or polarized light if if you are using visible light the color is red pink right red or pink and if you are using the polarized light the same will convert into apple green that is our question right now now you can see the two slides back to back can you see the two slides back to back yes or no so can you see it here here the color of the amyloid is pink color can you see it is pink here extracellularly it is pink here extracellularly it is now you see the corresponding areas here the corresponding areas here the corresponding pink areas here whatever pink was there it get converted to green 
So here also I can see the green, here also I can see the green. It's the same slide, you know, the same slide. Here we are using visible light and here we are using polarized light. The, the stain is same, it's Congo red. So Congo red on visible light gives red color and Congo red on polarized light gives green color. Both of them are in front of you, right? Both the diagrams are in front of you. Can we go ahead? So you can see this is the polarized light, the polarized microscope we are using like that. This is the actual apple green color we are talking about. On fluorescent stains, it is fluorescent color like yellow like that. Immunohistochemistry is specific, right? So we are done with amyloid. Coming on the next question quickly, okay? So next topic quickly, I mean to say. So coming on the next question, the next topic. There is a 24-year-old female, okay? There is a young, there is a female complaining of neurological deficits. Some neurological deficits are there like tingling, loss of sensation or some neurological deficits are there. Along with the neurological deficits, the patient have pallar. Whenever in your question in pathology, the pallar is men mentioned that the examiner is talking or indicating you towards the anemia. Patient have anemia, so the hemoglobin is less and because of the less hemoglobin, the earliest uh, symptom is the pallar. Earliest sign is the pallar, you know. So, pallar is there and the blood picture is given to you. I see the blood picture. Now, I guess everyone knows how to approach a blood smear for anemia. Now, you tell me, is it folate deficiency anemia, vitamin B12 deficiency anemia, thalassemia or iron deficiency anemia? Look at the image, correlate with the clinical clues given to you and come on the conclusion. Can you tell me? Now, what is the approach? In the approach, you have to see the lymphocyte in the slide. It should be there. Always, whenever a peripheral smear given to you for uh, uh, diagnosis of anemia, they will always give you a lymphocyte to compare the size of the RBCs. Now, please compare the size of the RBC. Can you see this RBC? Can you see this RBC? This one, this one, this one, this one. I can see most of the RBCs are bigger as compared to lymphocyte. So, can I say it's a typical case of megaloblastic anemia? Yes, megaloblastic anemia. The megaloblastic anemia, the RBCs are bigger as compared to the lymphocyte, number one. Number two, one more very big clue given to you, one of the neutrophil. Can you see one of the neutrophil in this diagram? Please appreciate this neutrophil. How many lobes are there? Can you count how many lobes are there in a normal neutrophil? Normal neutrophil have two to five lobes. Okay, count the lobes here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Many lobes are there. Of course, it is more than five. So, this neutrophil is known as hypersegmented neutrophil, which is another hallmark of megaloblastic anemia. So, two clues pointing towards megaloblastic anemia. Number one, the RBCs are bigger in size. And number two, the neutrophil is showing uh, multi-lobated neutrophil is there, hyper-segmented neutrophil is there. Both are pointing towards megaloblastic anemia. Okay, it's not thalassemia, it's not iron deficiency anemia, it's a megaloblastic anemia. Now, megaloblastic anemia is of two types. There are two causes of megaloblastic anemia. Folic acid deficiency and vitamin B12 deficiency, both of them leads to megaloblastic anemia. So, from the image, I come to know it's a megaloblastic anemia and patient has pallar also. It's correlating. But whether it is vitamin B12 or folic acid, how I come to know? Whether answer A is correct or B is correct? So, for that, the biggest clue given to you is neurological symptoms. Neurological symptoms occurs only in vitamin B12 deficiency. Neurological symptoms don't occur in folic acid deficiency. So, neurological symptoms always occur in vitamin B12 deficiency. That's why my correct answer is vitamin B12 deficiency. So, in the image, I can see macrocytosis. In the image, I can see hypersegmented neutrophil. That is giving a clue. It's a megaloblastic anemia. And in the megaloblastic anemia, we have two options, vitamin B12 deficiency, folic acid deficiency. Among them, the neurological deficit is indicating pointing towards the vitamin B12 deficiency. So, let's study megaloblastic anemia in detail and end this topic. If you get any question on megaloblastic anemia, you will be able to solve that. Okay, so what is megaloblastic anemia? What is the problem in megaloblastic anemia? In megaloblastic anemia, one of the two problems occur. Either patient have vitamin B12 deficient in the blood or patient have folic acid deficient in the blood or both of them. That will lead to megaloblastic anemia. Now, you should ask me a question, ma'am, why vitamin B12 and folic acid deficiency is leading to the anemia? Why does folic acid deficiency or vitamin B12 deficiency leading to anemia? Uh, iron deficiency, we can understand. If patient have iron deficiency, iron is required for heme synthesis. So, no iron, no heme or less iron, less heme. Less heme matlab less hemoglobin. Less hemoglobin matlab anemia. We can make it out. In iron deficiency anemia, we can make it out. But tell me why folic acid and vitamin B12 are deficient, how does they lead to anemia? How does? So, folic acid and vitamin B12, they are not required for heme or hemoglobin synthesis. They have nothing to do with heme or hemoglobin synthesis. They are required for DNA synthesis. They are required for DNA synthesis and DNA is required for nuclear synthesis. So, if vitamin B12 or folic acid is deficient, DNA will not synthesize. So, nucleus will not mature properly and that's why the patient have anemia. So, nucleus in RBC precursors I am talking. 
nucleus and rbc precursors i am talking that's why the patient have anemia this is the reason now dna in the dna how dna synthesis require vitamin b12 and folic acid at what step if you want to know the exact step in the dna there are four nucleotides na adenine guanine cytosine and thymidine have you ever thought how does this thymidine is formed thymidine kaise banta hai how does this thymidine is formed so uracil get converted to thymidine basically uracil get converted to thymidine and for this step for this conversion for this conversion we require vitamin b12 and folic acid both if any of them is deficient or both of them is deficient so uracil will not convert into thymidine thymidine will not form so dna will not form so nucleus will not form and that will lead to anemia you got my point so here there is defective dna synthesis which step of dna you can see the exact step it's also a pyq you can see for the conversion of uracil to thymidine what is ump uracil monophosphate deoxy uracil monophosphate and what is tmp thymidine monophosphate deoxy thymidine monophosphate so for this conversion for this conversion two things are required this is tetrahydrofolate that is folic acid and this is vitamin b12 both are required if any of them is deficient this conversion will not take place and uh, thymidine is not formed thymidine is not formed dna is not formed dna is not formed nucleus is not formed that will lead to anemia now you should ask me one more question ma'am rbcs don't have nucleus if nucleus is not formed it's okay but rbc are non nucleated cell how does it causes the anemia i agree rbc are non nucleated but what about the precursors of rbc can you see all these precursors pro normoblast early normoblast intermediate normoblast late normoblast reticular they all have the nucleus so if dna maturation is not there dna synthesis is not there so nucleus of the precursor will not form and the rbc cytoplasm is normal that's why rbc is larger in size cytoplasm is normal but you know the uh dna will not form nucleus will not form so basically here the nuclear maturation lag behind the cytoplasmic maturation you got my words the nuclear maturation lag behind the cytoplasmic maturation so whether vitamin b12 or whether folic acid if any of them are deficient both of them are required for the synthesis of dna so if any of them is deficient dna will not form dna will not form nucleus will not form nucleus will not form the patient have megaloblastic anemia right anemia will occur in both both deficiency but there is a additional function of vitamin b12 vitamin b12 not folic acid vitamin b12 is required for conversion of methanol coa to succinyl coa and this succinyl coa is required for axons neurons the axons of the neurons now imagine if vitamin b12 is absent this conversion will not take place and the myelin sheath will not form so patient have neurological deficit so my point is that if the patient have vitamin b12 deficiency what are the two symptoms if the patient have folic acid deficiency what are the one symptom so megaloblastic anemia occurs in both of them because both of them are required for synthesis of dna right but neurological symptoms neurological symptoms occurs only in vitamin b12 deficiency not folic acid deficiency so that was the biggest clue given in our question right the biggest clue given in our question let's have a look, look on the question again can you see this question here the patient have neurological symptoms and megaloblastic anemia from the image we have concluded that the patient have megaloblastic anemia from this image we have concluded that the patient have megaloblastic anemia the patient have megaloblastic anemia and here the patient have neurological deficit also that's why it's not folic acid deficiency it's vitamin b12 deficiency that is how we become sure shot for our answer now here you can see this is uh, the hypersegmented neutrophil we are topic talking apart from hypersegmented neutrophil there are three more features which occurs in the peripheral smear of megaloblastic anemia the patient may have basophilic stippling can you see this is the rbc this is the rbc appreciate the stippling inside that the blue color dot like structure that is the stippling now appreciate the cabot ring the ring of eight appreciate the hovel jolly body the dot like structure it's the inclusion body in the rbc appreciate the inclusion body in the rbc okay now i am coming on i am coming on leukocytes the next is the wbcs here the wbcs are hypersegmented it is the first manifestation of megaloblastic anemia here the wbcs have more than 5 lobes here you can count how many lobes are there 1 2 3 4 5 6 6 lobes are there more than 5 is hyper hypersegmented neutrophil so basically what we have learned let me summarize we have learned megaloblastic anemia what are the differences from normal peripheral smear the rbc here c rbc here so rbc is bigger that is known as megaloblast megaloblast the bigger rbc c neutrophil here c neutrophil here count the number of lobes here the number of lobes are 3 to 
here the number of lobes are more than 5 it is known as hyper segmented neutrophil so see the two hallmark feature i want you to see the two hallmark feature of megaloblastic anemia they are in front of you right so before going to the next question the next topic let me tell you something you all are going to become doctor most of you are already got their degrees and the remaining are waiting for their certificates and you are preparing for your post graduation to become specialized in some of the branch right so you are not dealing with machines you are not dealing with anything else you are going to deal with human lives come on it's a very big thing so sometime you may feel of not studying or all so always remember why you are studying what is the purpose of study you are going to study to save the lives. It's very, very, very big thing. You know, so people consider you the next to God. And it's a very big responsibility, very big privilege. Being God is not easy job. If you want to take like a second to God, you have to become that much perfect. Right. So you have to study hard. The chapter you are learning today, it's not a chapter. It's someone's life in your hand. Today I taught you amyloidosis, I told you, I taught you megaloblastic anemia. These are the chapters or topics for you, for your MCQ purpose. But one day you will see the live cases in that. The live cases you will see. Okay, so that is the thing. Can we go ahead? Can we go ahead? The next topic, the next question we are uh, going to discuss. So let me read the next question for you. Just a second. Let me read the next question for you. There is a 35-year-old lady. Take the age, take the gender. There is a 35-year-old lady presented with slow-growing thyroid swelling from the past 10 months. The lady has slow-growing thyroid swelling from the past 10 months. Histological examination was done and microscopic image of the biopsy show orphan any eye nuclei. So, what is the diagnosis? Is it follicular carcinoma, papillary carcinoma, anaplastic carcinoma, medullary carcinoma? So, all the four options are carcinoma, carcinoma of thyroid. So definitely it's a case of malignancy. The patient have the malignancy. It is correlating also. Thyroid malignancies are more common in females. So this, she is a female, middle-aged female. She is having a slow-growing thyroid swelling also. And that the biopsy is showing orphan any eye nuclei. So which of the four thyroid cancer shows orphan any eye nuclei? Can you tell me? Which of the thyroid cancer shows orphan any eye nuclei? Can you please tell me? The answer is papillary carcinoma. Let me explain you. Let me explain you. There are... Just a second. Uh, okay. There are four types of malignant tumors in the thyroid. How many types of malignant tumors in the thyroid? There are four types of malignant tumors in the thyroid. What are the four types of malignant tumors in the thyroid? Papillary carcinoma, follicular carcinoma, medullary carcinoma and anaplastic carcinoma. You have to understand the differences between them. I will show you this table again and we will read this table, understand this table. But before that, let me tell you, let me explain you the histopathological findings of them. So let's start with the papillary carcinoma of thyroid. You can see this is most common. Most common is papillary. 80% is papillary only. Out of the total 100% of thyroid malignancy, 80% is papillary carcinoma. The remaining 10 to 20% are follicular. They are second most common. 5% are medullary, 5% are anaplastic. These two are rare. Okay, so you have to learn. And all of them are more common in female. See the ratio of female is to male. So it's 3 is to 1, 2.5 is to 1, 1.5 is to 1, except medullary. It's a very important PYQ. In medullary, the male is to female, the female is to male is 1 is to 1. So, only thyroid carcinoma which is equal incidence in male and female is medullary. Rest all are more common in female. In our question, the, 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 there was a lady. She was a female. Right? So, it is a clue for you. Okay? Now, coming on the papillary. The papillary is the most common I told you. It is having a correlation with the radiation. Radiation in the past. So, neck radiation in the past or thyroglossal cyst, these are the two risk factors for papillary thyroid carcinoma. Grossly, how does the tumor look like? Grossly, you can see the papillae. Can you see? These all are papillae. What are papillae? Papillae are finger-like projections. The finger-like projections are known as papillae projections, right? Grossly, you can see that. Microscopically, this is the diagram. In the microscopy, again, you can see the papillae. You can see finger-like projections. The tumor cells are arranged in finger-like projection with a fibrovascular stalk. Can you see the stalk is the fibrovascular? What do you mean by fibrovascular stalk? Okay. Let me draw the finger-like projections. Okay. Few finger-like projections I am drawing. Okay. So, where are the tumor cells? The tumor cells are arranged here. The tumor cells are arranged here forming a layer over the papillae. The papillae are the finger-like projections like that. These are the papillae. These are the finger-like projections. The finger-like projections like that. Okay. And there is a fibrovascular stalk. 
this is a vascularity we are looking for vascularity right and there is fibrosis in the background okay this is the stalk so the stalk is fibrovascular in which there is vascularity the blood vessels are there and there is little bit fibrosis and on it the finger like projections are there right so that is the i'm sorry so you can see that is the arrangement of the tumor cells in papillary carcinoma that is the arrangement now if you zoom out one of the cell and see one of the cell so let me draw one of the cell for you if you zoom out one of the cell this is the cell if you see the nucleus the nucleus have a very unique feature okay. i'm really sorry i'm really sorry the nucleus had a very unique feature the nucleus is not compact from inside the color of the nucleus is ground glass the color of the nucleus is ground glass appearance ground glass it is known as orphan any eye nuclei orphan any eye nuclei the appearance is correlated let me tell you so who is any do you know who is any any is a cartoon character she is a girl she is cartoon and she is orphan she don't have parents so the the eyes are empty can you see the eyes are empty from inside so this is a cartoon character the eyes are always shown empty and it is known as any any is the name like like mickey mouse we have this is a cartoon character so if you see the nucleus here the nucleus inside is empty see the nucleus is empty the nucleus is empty can you see the nucleus now see the orphan any eye and see the nucleus so we say the nucleus is like orphan any eye that was our question right now that was our question right now orphan any eye nucleus you got it say yes or no so there is a papillary pattern the tumor cells are arranged in a single layer there is a fibrovascular stalk at the center in the tumor cells the nucleus is optically clear it is known as orphan any eye nucleus it is ground glass appearance one more unique feature is there let me draw one one tumor cell this is one of the tumor cell this is the nucleus so my point is that the nucleus is empty okay wo to ho gaya the nucleus is empty and that's why it is known as orphan any i nuclei orphan any i nuclei right one more thing which is very unique here is the inclusion bodies there are many inclusion bodies the inclusion bodies are present in the cytoplasm also and the inclusion bodies are present in the nucleus also so intracytoplasmic as well as intranuclear inclusion bodies is also a unique feature is also a unique feature so the third thing is inclusion bodies intranuclear inclusion bodies and intracytoplasmic inclusion bodies and in the nucleus sometimes grooving is present let me explain you see this is a zoom version can you see the tumor cell now see the nucleus see the groove see the nucleus see the groove see the nucleus see the groove so most of the nucleus is having grooving also so that is all about papillary carcinoma appreciate this is nucleus inside the nucleus appreciate the intranuclear inclusion body appreciate this is nucleus appreciate the grooving appreciate the grooving and one more important finding last is calcification sometime in papillary carcinoma of thyroid there is calcification the calcification is in concentric rings can you see here bluish calcification it is known as samoma in samoma the p is silent don't say pisamoma it's samoma bodies okay that is the calcification so we are done finally i am summarizing papillary carcinoma of thyroid papillary carcinoma of thyroid the microscopy of that so first thing the pattern the pattern is like papilla okay i'm drawing a little bit papillary pattern this is the pattern let me draw the tumor cells arranged on that i'm drawing big big tumor cells to show you the morphology from inside so these are the tumor cells i'm drawing on the papilla the core the next is the core in the core we have fibrovascular stalk the so vascularity is by the capillaries the blood vessels okay and there is fibrosis in the background the background is showing fibrosis this is fibrovascular stalk let's talk about individual cell in the individual cell they all have nucleus the nucleus is clear from inside it's optically clear known as orphan any i nuclei orphan any i nuclei okay it's optically clear one more thing there are inclusion bodies inclusion bodies in the cytoplasm and nucleus not all cells some of the cells have show some of the cells have cytoplasmic some of the cell have nuclear inclusion body the last thing is there inside the nucleus there is grooving there is grooving groove is there inside the nucleus you can see the grooving so these are all features of papillary carcinoma of thyroid on which you get many questions and samoma bodies yeah one more thing is samoma bodies coming on the next question supravital staining is used for supravital staining is used for can you tell me supravital staining it is used for rbc or platelet or reticulocyte or wbc for what it is used is it rbc platelet reticulocyte or wbc what is the correct answer yes you all are right the correct answer is reticulocyte so we will see everything of the reticulocyte so what are reticulocyte 
So for understanding reticulocyte, you tell me how does the RBC is formed? Where does the RBC is formed? All, all the blood cells are formed in the bone marrow. Can you see a bone? Inside the bone marrow, all the blood cells are formed. So let me draw a bone marrow. This is the bone marrow. The first cell in the bone marrow is hematopoietic stem cell. What is the first cell in the bone marrow? The first cell in the bone marrow is hematopoietic stem cell. Okay, it's a hematopoietic uh, stem cell is there. Okay, now from the hematopoietic stem cell, first the myeloid progenitor will come. The myeloid stem cell, the myeloid progenitor will come. Now from this, what are the other precursors? First of all, uh, a pro-normoblast will come. Then early normoblast, intermediate normoblast, late normoblast, reticulocyte and finally RBC. What I have said, I will start again from the beginning. First of all, a pro-normoblast, then early, early normoblast, then intermediate normoblast, then late normoblast, then reticulocyte, reticulocyte and finally the RBCs are formed. Hi, right. So this is the sequence. Currently my topic to teach you is reticulocyte. So can I say the reticulocyte is the immediate precursor of RBC? Yes, it's just precursor of RBC. Now finally the RBC is formed, it will come in the blood. This is the blood vessel. This is the blood vessel. In this blood vessel, this RBC after forming here, it will come in the blood. Right. 1 to 2 percent reticulocyte also come in the blood. 1 to 2 percent reticulocyte also come in the blood. So please learn the sequence. The first thing you have to learn the sequence. The pro-normoblast, early normoblast, intermediate normoblast, late normoblast, reticulocyte and RBC. Okay. Learn the other names of early, intermediate and late. Early normoblast also known as basophilic normoblast. Intermediate is known as pro, um, it is known as polychromatic normoblast and late is known as orthochromatic normoblast. How to learn that? I am having a mnemonic for you. The mnemonic is BPO, basophilic, polychromatic and orthochromatic, BPO, early, intermediate, late. You have to learn that, okay? And here finally reticulocyte is coming in the blood. So you can see here, <laughs> the same sequence is shown to you. This is pro-normoblast, early normoblast, intermediate normoblast. Late normoblast, reticulocyte and finally erythrocyte that is RBC. Okay, so again I am repeating pro-normoblast, early normoblast, intermediate normoblast, late normoblast, reticulocyte and finally RBC. I told you the other names, already I told you the other names. Early normoblast known as basophilic normoblast, intermediate normoblast known as polychromatic normoblast, late normoblast known as orthochromatic normoblast and finally reticulocyte and then RBCs are formed. My point to show you here is that it is having the first cell have a nucleus, this is have a nucleus, this is have a nucleus, 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 nucleus. At this stage, the nucleus is extruded out of the cell. It is thrown out of the cell. It is known as enucleation. At late normoblast, I mean to say the last two cells are non-nucleated. The nucleus is present here, present here, present here, present here and here it is extruded. So they don't have nucleus. The last two cells don't have nucleus, you can see. So I mean to say like RBC, reticulocytes are also non-nucleated cells. In the reticulocyte also, the nucleus is absent. So these are the cells. These are just precursor of RBC. They don't have nucleus. These are slightly larger than RBC. Okay. You can see inside that nucleus is not there. So what is present here? What is present in the cytoplasm? In the cytoplasm, you are getting rRNA. The network, the meshwork of rRNA. You know, there are three types of RNA. Messenger RNA, transport RNA and ribosomal RNA. So I'm talking about ribosomal RNA, which is present in the cytoplasm of the ribosomes. Right. That's why these, it is known as ribosome. Ribosome ka matlab kya hota hai? Ribo, uh, I'm sorry, not ribosome, reticulocyte. So reticulocyte ka meaning hai, it's the meshwork of the ribosomal RNA. Okay. So what stains we use to stain them? We use two supravital stain. Supravital stain is a stain which stain rRNA. It stain rRNA. Not other cell, it will stain only rRNA. There are two supravital stain, the methylene blue and chrysyl blue. And that was our question right now. The methylene blue and the chrysyl blue. Can you see this diagram? Now this is normal Romanowski stain. This is the normal Romanowski stain you can see here. Right. So can you identify which one is RBC, which one is reticulocyte? You can. You will say ma'am, we, we are not very sure. Both of them don't have nucleus. Both of them look alike. But uh, the reticulocyte is a little bit larger. That's it. So we cannot ident identify which one is a reticulocyte. So just stain with the supravital stain. Just stain with the supravital stain. Now on staining, can you see this cell and this cell? Inside this cell, you can see the blue dot-like structure, the blue dot-like structure. This blue dot-like structure is rRNA. Supravital stain, stain rRNA. RBC don't have rRNA. Uh, but um, this um, uh, reticulocytes have. So it will highlight the reticulocyte and you can count the reticulocyte and count the retic count. Can you see this cell, this cell, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. All these are reticulocytes. Can you see that? 
right so suprovital stain is a stain which which stain ribosomes ribosomes and ribosomal rna it is present only in reticulocyte not in rbc coming on the next question now small or medium sterile vegetations are found on both the sides of the heart wall in a sle patient so it is seen in which endocarditis non bacterial thrombotic endocarditis rheumatic heart disease infective endocarditis or leibman sack endocarditis so the next question is on endocarditis see all the options are from endocarditis you are given three clues in the question number one the patient is having sle the biggest clue number two vegetation is on both side of the heart wall the upper as well as lower and number three the vegetations are small to medium and sterile they don't have bacteria they don't have bacteria not sterile so rule out infective endocarditis common sense infective endocarditis have bacteria na so here the vegetations are non sterile but in the exa the examiner is asking you a sterile vegetation right it cannot be infective endocarditis among the rest three what is the correct answer so yes the correct answer is libman sac it's libman sac endocarditis it's time to study the endocarditis in detail now we will study the entire endocarditis in detail now we will study the entire endocarditis in detail okay so let's start endocarditis for that i would like to tell you the three layers of the heart what are the three layers of the heart can you tell me the heart have three layers endocardium myocardium and pericardium what are the three layers in this diagram you can see the red one is the endocardium you can see the middle black one is the myocardium and you can see the outermost blue one is the pericardium endocardium myocardium and pericardium these are the three layers so it's endocardium let me mark the red is the endocardium the black is the myocardium and outermost layer is the pericardium now you tell me the walls of the heart these are the walls of the heart can you see this is a heart wall this is a heart wall the walls of the heart you can see right so can you tell me the walls of the heart are made up of what the walls of the heart are made up of what so they are made up of only endocardium so can i say endocardium is of two type the endocardium which is present over the heart walls is known as valvular endocardium and the endocardium which is present on rest of the heart is known as mural endocardium right so what is the disease endocarditis known as what is endocarditis endocarditis is a disease it is a disease in which the endocardium is inflamed so both the endocardium will involve of course the mural also will involve and mainly valvular endocardium will involve whenever the walls of the heart will involve on the heart walls there are certain nodular 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 uh, projections are formed nodularity is there that is known as vegetation so you got my point what are vegetation the first thing you have to understand vegetation ka matlab kya hota hai what is the vegetation so vegetation is the small nodularity present on the wall present on the wall due to the inflammation of the endocardium that is in all endocarditis the vegetations are seen now basically in your syllabus there syllabus there are four types of endocarditis in your syllabus what are the four type of endocarditis in your syllabus the rheumatic fever non bacterial thrombotic endocarditis libman sac endocarditis and infective endocarditis also known as marantric endocarditis right now in all of them the vegetation is there you can see all of them they have the vegetation this is rheumatic heart disease this is lib sl libman sac that is seen in sle that is our question right now non bacterial thrombotic endocarditis and the last one is the infective endocarditis you can see in all of them the vegetations are there you can see the yellow vegetations but their location is di different their morphology is different their uh, uh, morphology is different their location is different right so we have to study that only now in rheumatic heart disease where are the vegetations present tell me the location now imagine for understanding the location i'm drawing a heart diagram this is a diagram of the heart i'm drawing and these are the walls this is the left side this is the right side and here i'm drawing the bicuspid wall here it's the tricuspid wall okay now these are the two cusp of the mitral wall look at the mitral wall look at the mitral wall look at the two cusp of the mitral wall so whenever the cusp are separated the blood is coming from auricle to ventricle and the whenever the cusp cusp are closed the blood is not coming so cusp cusp open they close they open they o close like that it is happening during the cardiac cycle now where are the vegetations formed in rheumatic heart disease right so in rheumatic heart disease vegetations are not formed now imagine this is auricle this is ventricle and this is the bicuspid wall this is the mitral wall you can see it is opening it is closing it is up opening and it is closing so the blood is coming from auricle to ventricle constantly now where are the vegetations formed the vegetations are formed on upper surface no the vegetations are formed on lower surface no the vegetations are formed at the junction yes at the line of the closure or at the junction so at the line of the closure or at the junction small small vegetations are formed see i am drawing it right so i am drawing like that so the vegetations are formed along the line of closure or at the junction you can see here in the diagram also you can see the vegetations are at the line of the closure 
or at the junction. Can you see? So here the vegetations are along the line of the closure and the junction in rheumatic fever. Right. In NBT also, it is along the line of closure. Both of them are same. But in Libman-Sec, SLE, it is on both surface. Upper surface and lower surface, not at the junction. And in infective endocard, it is only upper surface. Only upper surface. You got my point? Only upper surface. So here you can see in Libman-Sec, the examiner have shown you the vegetation on both surface. This is upper surface. And intentionally examiner have, uh, the author have shown you, the image is showing you the flip flap. On lower side also, you can see the vegetation. The vegetation is on the upper surface as well as lower surface. But in infective endocarditis, only upper surface. So what are the four types of endocarditis? Let me summarize. What is endocarditis? Endocarditis means inflammation of the innermost of the innermost layer of the heart. That is known as endocardium. Endocardium, myocardium, pericardium. So in all endocarditis, the walls are involved. Whenever the walls are involved, the vegetations are there on the heart walls. Vegetations are always there. Now there are four types of endocarditis. Rheumatic fever. Non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis, Libman-Sec endocarditis and infective endocarditis. These are the four types of endocarditis we have, right? Now here the vegetations are formed along the line of closure, that is junction. Here also line of closure junction. Here upper and lower surface, here only upper surface. This is how you have to learn. If you want, you can draw diagrams also. Now look at your question, you can easily make it out, right? So coming to the next question. Can I start the next question now? Can I start the next question? Coming on the next question. There is a person having hepatic jointus. The jointus is due to liver failure. Okay. Okay. So, hepatic jointus is there. Deranged liver function test is there. And a clinical image of the eye is shown to you. Can you identify the disease? Three hints given to you. Right. Age is not given. Gender is not given. Patient have jointus. Deranged liver function test. And eye diagram is given to you. Is it Huntington's chorea? Is it Wilson disease? Is it leak syndrome? Is it hematochromatosis? So what is the correct answer? Can, can anyone tell? Now look at the image. What is the clue given in the image? The biggest clue to you given to you in the image. In the image, in the cornea, you can see a brown color ring. Can you appreciate this brown color ring I am drawing for you? I am highlighting for you, I mean. You can see this brown color ring we are talking. This is a brown color ring in the cornea. Right? So what is this ring? This brown color ring. This is... This ring, there is a name, there is a particular name given to this ring. The particular disease is Wilson's disease. Let me explain you everything about the uh, uh, Wilson disease. We will understand this ring also and we will come on the question back. Let's start Wilson's disease. What is happening in Wilson's disease? Okay, we will see two diagrams. One normal, one Wilson disease. See, this is a normal healthy individual. Can you see the diagram? This is a normal healthy individual. Whenever any person eat copper in the diet, we all eat a little bit copper in the diet, right? It is a mineral. So the copper will go in the mouth. The copper will go in these figures. The copper will go in the stomach. It will go in the intestine. It will absorb from the intestine and reach in the blood. In the blood, it will bind with albumin. From the blood, it will go to the liver. It will go in the liver. It will go in one of the cell of the liver. Can you see? It is one of the hepatocyte. One of the cell of the liver, right? So this copper will go inside. Now in the liver, in the liver, one protein is synthesized. The name of that protein is alpha-2 globulin. For the synthesis of this protein, one gene is required. It is known as ATPase. ATPase. ATPase gene is required. ATP7 is. ATP, ATPase gene is required, right? This ATPase gene, alpha-2 globulin, it, uh, it will form. So this alpha-2 globulin bind with the copper and the combination of the two is known as ceruloplasmin. What is ceruloplasmin? It is having two things. Number one, free copper and number two, alpha-2 globulin. So free copper is toxic, but ceruloplasmin is not toxic, right? So it will be saved. I, I mean, it will be stored in human body in the form of ceruloplasmin. The copper is stored in the form of the ceruloplasmin like that, right? But what is happening in this is normal. So whenever we take copper, the copper will go in the intestine. From the small intestine, it will absorb. In the blood, it will form a complex with the albumin. Now it will go in the portal circulation. It will go in the liver. In the liver, the free copper is taken by the hepatocyte, right? Copper inside the liver bind with alpha-2 globulin and forms ceruloplasmin and remains stored there. That's it. But what happens in Wilson's disease? In Wilson's disease, the gene is mutated. You know, ATP7B. What is the name of the gene? ATP7B gene is mutated. So ATPase will not form. Alpha-2 globulin will not form. Copper will remain free only. Right. So this copper, whatever you are eating in the diet, it will absorb, it will go in the liver. But liver don't have alpha-2 globulin because of mutation of the gene required for the synthesis. The name of the gene is ATP7B and that is missing. If the gene is missing, if the gene is missing, alpha-2 globulin will not form. If alpha-2 globulin will not form, 
the free copper remain in the hepatocyte first it will cause hepatic damage because of which the patient will have joined this then it will leak back in the blood from the blood it will go in the eye it will go in the brain and it will go in other organs okay so that is wilson's disease what is the problem in wilson's disease please learn in wilson disease there is mutation in atp 7b gene this gene is present on chromosome number 13 right this gene is present on chromosome number 13 since there is a mutation in this gene atps will not form atps will not form alpha 2 globulin will not form alpha 2 globulin will not form the free copper will accumulate it will cause toxic injury to the liver and go back in the uh, blood from the blood it will go in the brain and the eyes okay so in the eye it form a ring the brown color ring in the cornea brown ring in the cornea it is known as kesher fletcher ring kf ring kf Kesher Fletcher ring, right? In the brain, in the brain, it gets deposited in the basal ganglion and it causes neurological symptoms. In the liver, it causes liver failure. The patient may have joined us for that, right? So that is the thing. Now have a look on your question. You can easily make it out. You all can easily make it out. Have a look on your question. Where is the question? There is a person with joined us, deranged liver function test, and you can see a ring. You can see a ring in the cornea, brown color ring in the cornea. Answer is Wilson's disease. The answer is Wilson's disease. You got it? Say yes if you got it. What is the correct answer? Yes. It's Wilson's disease. Okay. It's Wilson's disease. You can make it out. The typical KF ring is given to you. Right. The next question is in front of you. There is a child presented with a history of Pellar. I told you whenever the examiner is giving you the word Pellar, they are, they are talking about the anemia. Right. The Pellar is always due to less hemoglobin. Less hemoglobin means anemia. So there is a child presented with Pellar. And fatigue, okay, the fatigue is a symptom due to the pallor, due to anemia, the patient is having fatigue. Uh, particular bleeding, the patient have particular bleeding. The bleeding is indicating thrombocytopenia. So, patient having anemia also, patient having thrombocytopenia also. And the patient is having fever. When the patient is having fever, the fever may be due to less effective, less um, uh, WBC. I mean, not exactly the number. Maybe the less um, effective WBC, you can say the mature WBC. Okay. On examination, there is an enlargement of liver as well as spleen with sternal tenderness. So, see the age, the child, the patient is having anemia. The anemia is not said directly, but indirectly the examiner told you pallor and fatigue. It means anemia. The patient is having thrombocytopenia. Thrombocytopenia is not said to you directly, but indirectly the examiner is telling you it's a particular bleeding and fever since last seven days on examination the patient have liver enlargement and no? hepatomegaly is there phenomegaly is there and sternal tenderness sternal tenderness sternal tenderness is there okay uh, which of the following is likely explanation for the symptoms of the child and the, the biggest clue given to you it's a child so what is the answer is it aplastic anemia is it cml is it all is it aml so can you tell me the answer what is the correct answer what is the correct answer here can anyone tell me yes the correct answer is of course it's all so because in children the most common leukemia which occurs in children is all and here the age is child right it cannot be aplastic anemia in aplastic anemia also the patient have pancytopenia i believe so anemia thrombocytopenia and fever can be explained but hepatomegaly splenomegaly and sternal tenderness do not occur in aplastic anemia now regarding the other three leukemias most common leukemia which can occur um, in a child so answer is all CML cannot be there because in CML the organ enlargement is not there. You know organ infiltration is not there. But organ infiltration that is hepatomegaly, spinomegaly and sternal tenderness, the three organ infiltration is given to you in the question. Bo uh, all three of them are present in ALL as well as AML. But among them, how to differentiate them? Now, what is the answer? Is it ALL or AML? Because everything is fitting in ALL also, everything is fitting in AML also. Now, the clinch in the question is the age. So, ALL occurs in child and AML occurs in old age, and right? middle or old age. The correct answer is ALL, right? It's time to understand leukemias and lymphomas, right? So, let me start. What is leukemia? What is lymphoma? You tell me where does the WBC is formed? All the WBCs are formed in the bone marrow. Can you see? This is the bone marrow. In the bone marrow, this is the WBCs are formed. How the WBCs are formed in the bone marrow? The first cell in the bone marrow is hematopoietic stem cell. Okay, from the hematopoietic stem cell, two types of blasts are formed. Myeloblast and lymphoblast. Myeloblast, myeloblast and lymphoblast. Before that, you tell me how many types of WBCs are there. Start from the basic. How many types of WBCs are there? WBCs are of two types. Granulocyte and a granulocyte. A granulocyte. Okay. Granulocytes are further of three types. Neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils. 
Granulocytes are the WBC, they have granules inside them. And A granulocytes are of two types, lymphocyte and um, monocyte. Hai na? They don't have granules in them, right? Now, they all are formed in the bone marrow. Of course, all WBCs are formed in the bone marrow. Now, in the bone marrow, we have two blasts, myeloblast and lymphoblast. We have two blasts, myeloblast and lymphoblast. So, except lymphoblast, lymphoblast form lymphocyte, except lymphocyte, rest all are formed from the myeloblast. Rest all are formed from the myeloblast. So, what does the myeloblast form? Myeloblast form neutrophil, eosinophil, basophil and monocyte. And what does the lymphoblast form? Lymphoblast form only lymphocyte, right? The same thing is shown to you here. In the bone marrow, see the hematopoietic stem cell. So, let me draw a bone marrow. Inside the bone marrow, let me draw the first cell. The first cell is hematopoietic stem cell as I told you. From the hematopoietic stem cell, the two blasts are formed. Say this is myeloblast, say this is lymphoblast. Now tell me the precursor, how does they give rise to the cell? So myeloblast give rise to promyelocyte, myelocyte, metamyelocyte, band form, finally neutrophil, eosinophil, basophil and monocyte. These all are formed like this. And lymphocyte give rise to prolymphocyte, prolymphocyte and lymphoblast. I mean the first is the lymphoblast, then prolymphocyte and finally lymphocyte. And they will come in the blood, right? So let me draw the blood vessel here. Let me draw the blood vessel. Now, in the blood, the mature WBCs come. What does I mean? All these mature form, neutrophil, eosinophil, basophil and monocyte and lymphocyte, they will come in the blood. My point or question to you, does the blast come in the blood? We all have blast, but in our marrow, not in blood. But the point when the blast come in the blood, it is known as leukemia. So, what is leukemia? Any of the blast is coming in the blood, whether myeloblast or lymphoblast. Based on that, we are classifying the leukemia. If myeloblast is coming in the blood, it is known as myeloid leukemia. And if lymphoblast is coming in the blood, it is known as lymphoid leukemia, right? So, myeloblast coming in the blood, myeloid leukemia. Lymphoblast coming in the blood, it is known as lymphoid leukemia. So, any blast coming in the blood is known as leukemia. Blast in blood. It is known as blast in blood. The blast in blood, okay, that is known as leukemia, right? What is leukemia? The blast in the blood. Having blast in the marrow is normal. But when the blast leave the marrow and migrate in the blood, it is known as leukemia. It is an abnormal finding. So why does the blast will come in the blood at all? Because there is certain mutations inside the blast. Because of the, their mutation, there is uncontrolled mitosis in them. They just might they just do the mitosis un in an uncontrolled manner and they replace all other cell and they are spilled over. I'm using the word spilled. They are using the, they are, they are just spilled over in the blood. It is known as leukemia. We got it. What is leukemia? Now what is lymphoma? After coming in the blood, these blast, blast may infiltrate in the solid organ. It can be liver, it can be spleen, it can be bone marrow, it can be lymph node, it can be anything. So whenever they infiltrate in the organ, it is known as lymphoma. So blast in blood is leukemia, but the blast or the mutated cell, the cancer cells in the solid organs, producing a mass, it's lymphoma. The leukemia is a blood cancer. You will not get any mass. But in the lymphoma, you will get a discrete mass, right? So this is the difference, the basics. What is leukemia? What is lymphoma, right? Now, let me classify the leukemias and lymphomas. Here you can see I'm classifying the leukemia into two categories. What are the two types of leukemia? When myeloblast is coming, it's myeloid leukemia. When lymphoblast is coming, it's lymphoid leukemia, okay? Now, both of them can be acute, can be chronic. The myeloid, so when myeloblast is coming, or when lymphoblast is coming. What is coming in the blood? This is the blood vessel. So when myeloblast is coming in the blood, it is known as myeloid leukemia. When lymphoblast is coming in the blood, it's known as lymphoid leukemia, right? Now both of them can be acute, can be chronic, can be acute, can be chronic. So in this way, we are having four types of leukemia. It's acute myeloid leukemia. It's chronic myeloid leukemia. Acute myeloid leukemia chronic myeloid leukemia, it's acute lymphoid leukemia and chronic lymphoid leukemia. So it's AML, ACML, ALL, CLL. So my point is that in both myeloid leukemia, the myeloblast is coming in the blood and in both lymphoid leukemia, the lymphoblast is coming in the blood. That is the basics you must know, right? Then, so this is the same classification given to you. So in leukemia, the blast is in the blood. So the blast can be uh, myeloid, the myeloblast, it can be lymphoid, the lymphoblast. Both of them can be acute chronic, acute chronic, right? So acute myeloid leukemia, chronic myeloid leukemia, acute lymphoid leukemia, chronic lymphoid leukemia can be there. So let's start with acute lymphoblastic leukemia or lymphoma. Okay, I'm teaching you ALL here in detail. Which one? ALL. 
okay that that was our question it occurs in children so in our question the age was the children only the age was the children right here the patient have two types of symptoms number one in the bone marrow uh, the lymphoblast is replacing everything can you see here i told you now the lymphoblast is doing uncontrolled mitosis so it replaces everything else only lymphoblasts are there and they will be spilled over they will be spilled over in the blood so lymphoblast replaced everything so in the bone marrow we have no rbc we don't have platelets we don't have platelets and we don't have mature wbc most of the wbc are only lymphoblast which are immature okay so that's why patient have anemia because rbcs are not synthesized patient have bleeding disorder because platelets are not synthesized and patient have infection because wbcs are there but all the wbcs are lymphoblast the mature forms are not there okay so that is the clinical feature due to bone marrow failure now after as i told you after coming in the blood they go in the organ also in which 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 organ it will go it can go in the bone causing bone tenderness especially in sternum in our question sternum tenderness was given right they go in the lymph node they go in the liver they go in the uh, uh, spleen hepatomegaly splenomegaly lymphadenopathy may be there they go in the media intestinal lymph nodes they can go in the brain also and they can go in the testes also testicular involvement can be there so that is the organ infiltration you can say okay so in the blood picture there is anemia thrombocytopenia in the wbc is blood cell in the blood cell you can say overall patient had leukopenia or leukocytosis but most of the cells are lymphoblast so this is the image you can see all the cells here are the lymphoblast can you can you see all the cells are the lymphoblast they all are 100% cells are lymphoblast you can see all the cells are lymphoblast they don't have iron rod in their cytoplasm this is how we differentiate the myeloblast from the lymphoblast right so lymphoblast have relatively large nucleus the cytoplasm is scanty hardly you can see any cytoplasm you can see only nucleus nc ratio is very very high and there is no iron rod all these cells are lymphoblast right so that is the thing coming on the next question now just a second let me come on the next question the next question is in front of you there is a tall male teenager okay take the clues there is a tall who is a male there is a teenager the age is teenage hai na presented with gynecomastia what do you mean by gynecomastia the breast enlargement in male the person is a male but the breast are enlarged like a female breast enlargement is known as gynecomastia okay on examination the secondary sexual characters are also absent right uh, the secondary sexual characters like pubic hair beard mustache they all are absent average cognition is there iq is good the average cognition average iq is there voice is deep the beard and male distribution of pubic hair is there beard is there mustache is not there maybe but the male distribution of hairs is there okay and the genetic analysis was performed and he was having the presence of one bar body one bar body can you make out the diagnosis there is a male there is a male who is having gynecomastia who is having no secondary sexual characters the height is good he is tall the beard is there deep voice is there pubic hairs are there and single bar body what is the diagnosis is it turner is it clinflinter is it swear or is it down yes you all are right the correct answer is the clinflinter syndrome so what is clinflinter syndrome let me tell you so what is the normal genetic makeup of a male or female this is a male this is a female i'm talking about normal so normally the males are xy everyone knows and the females are double x everyone knows right now let me tell you what is a bar body what is a bar body bar body you know according to leon hypothesis leon is a scientist who has given a hypothesis that um one x is always inactive the first x is always inactive so in male there is only one x so that is inactive this one is inactive this one is inactive but in female there are two x na one is inactive one is active one is active the active one is known as bar body the active one is known as bar body so can i say normal males don't have any bar body normal healthy males have zero bar body and the females have one bar body this is normal this is normal so all the healthy genetic healthy uh, males have zero bar body and all the genetically healthy females have one bar body right so that is a bar body the the one which is um uh, inactivated right now Uh, in clinflinter syndrome there is one extra x in a male in a male it's extra x so how many chromosomes normally a person have normally a person have 46 chromosomes so instead of 46 the total chromosome are 47 47 so it's x x y it's not x y it's double x y so here the male will have one bar, bar body like female so it was a male in your question it was mentioned the person is a male but male should have zero bar body na here the male is having one bar body so straight forward diagnosis is clinflinter syndrome here since it is double x y so actually it's a male but with a extra x chromosome so it will be like female 
enlargement of the breast will be there and the other female features will be there but it is a male the iq is normal so iq is little bit lower but overall it is average stature is tall poor muscle tone reduced secondary sexual characters gynecomastia and small testes such males are infertile and this is known as klinefelter syndrome so my point is that normal male normal female normal male is xy and normal female is xx let me tell you two diseases here one of male one of female in male instead of normal xy i am giving one extra x and the disease is known as klin splinter syndrome in female instead of 2x i am giving only one x other is zero and a x zero right so this 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 disease is known as turner syndrome okay so i told you two diseases one in male one in female both are infertile and both don't have secondary sexual character here the height is good here the female is short the height is less uh the average iq is good in klinefelter but in turner there is mental retardation so you can learn the symptoms okay and uh, regarding the bar bodies normal male have zero bar body normal female have one bar body right klinefelter is a male with one bar body and turner is a female with zero bar body right so it is an abnormal condition normal female have one but turner have zero normal male have zero but klinefelter have one i hope you got it what is bar body and you got this genetic makeup if you can tell me the total number of chromosomes it's good so normal total number of chromosomes is 46 46 but here in klinefelter it will be 47 one extra x is there and in turner it will be 45 So what do you say? What is Klinefelter syndrome? What is Turner syndrome? So here I will write like forty-seven X X Y, and here I will comma X X Y. So total total chromosomes are forty-seven, and one extra X is there, and it's a male, right? And here total chromosomes are forty-five, comma it's X zero, one X other is missing, and it's a female. So this is the summary. This is the summary. You frequently get questions on that, and especially their bar body. If you say the bar body, it's a male with one bar body. It's a female with zero bar body. This is the summary. You get many questions on that. And apart from that, you have to learn the symptoms. You have to learn the symptoms. Let me come on the next question. Before coming on the next question, let me tell you a small thing. You know, I always say my students always shoot out for the moon. Even if you miss, you will land among the stars. What do you mean by that? Moon means the high target, है ना? Target should be rank one. Target should always be rank one. Whatever exams you are targeting, you are targeting NEET, PG, FMG, INST. In FMG there is no ranking. I know it's a licensing exam, but after the FMG, the first thing you should score good. And after scoring good, it's not a end journey, na? No? You will give USMLE, PLAB, or whatever you will give, right? So you will give some or the other competitive exam to get a rank. So whether you will do MD or you will do MS, in which branch you have nineteen options, you have millions of colleges. so which branch which institute you will do so that depends on your rank your rank actually decides your future right so if you are rank 1 na all the options are open to you right all 19 options all the hundreds millions thousands of institutes so you do the branch of your choice from the best institute dream branch from the dream institute right it is only possible if you are rank 1 right so target should be rank 1 even if you miss you will be under 10 even if you miss you will be under 100 Even if you miss, you will be under thousand, right? But if you target that rank, then कुछ भी चलेगा, ten thousand तक भी चलेगा, five thousand तक भी चलेगा, कुछ private college ले लेंगे, so it's not a good thing. अगर वो miss हुआ तो कहाँ जाओगे? You will be nowhere. So always shoot out high, shoot for the moon. Even if you miss, you will land among the stars. So that is the meaning. Can we go to the next question? So a little bit motivation is always required for good studies. Do you believe this or not? The next question is in front of you. There is a sixteen-year-old boy. having abdominal discomfort on the left side and he went to his physician to see the age see the gender see the complaint on the left side he is having some abdominal pain and he his father has the similar condition during his teenage his father so it is something genetic hai na because the father had the same condition later later uh, the father have some malignancy the father have some malignancy right now this boy undergo colonoscopy and the image is given to you what you can see in the image and what is your diagnosis in the image i can see hundreds or thousands of polyps the entire colon is studded with polyps the entire colon i can see only polyps in the entire colon so is it familial adenoposis polyposis is it colon cancer is it ulcerative colitis or is it lynch syndrome what is the correct answer can you please tell me the correct answer yes it's a typical case of familial adenomatous polyposis where the entire colon is studded with um, millions of polyps more than hundreds of polyps are seen it's a autosomal dominant condition it is genetic and the gene which is mutated is apc gene which is present on chromosome number 5 so you have questions on all of them 
the chromosome number is the also a question the name of the gene apc gene is also a question it's autosomal dominant it's also a question and in the entire colon hundreds of polyps are there right later on these polyps convert into malignancy it is a pre malignant condition later on it is malignant it's familial so whenever you find such condition the treatment is complete prophylactic uh, you have to do the surgery and remove the colon the complete procto scopy the procto uh, proctectomy can be the treatment the complete colon has to be removed prophylactically not only this you have to learn all the genes all the important diseases with their mutated gene so familial adenomatous polyposis the gene which is mutated is apc it is a pyq in gardner syndrome the gene which is mutated is again apc in turcot syndrome the gene which is mutated is again apc in hamartomatous uh, or putz jagger syndrome it is stk11 juvenile polyposis syndrome the name of the gene is smad4 right and in cowden syndrome it is p10 so all these are various types of polyps present in the git right here you can see the image of familial adenomatous polyposis you can see the same image is the zoom version you can see the entire colon is filled with the colon uh, polyps here also the entire colon is studded with the polyps so coming on the next question there is a 30 year old male 30 year male presented with a complaint of painless testicular mass so in a 30 year young male the testicular mass is there which is painless right his blood sample show elevated alpha uh, i am sorry his blood sugar uh, blood sample show normal alpha fetoprotein the afp alpha fetoprotein levels are normal which of the following is the most likely diagnosis is it yolk sac tumor is it seminoma is it teratoma or is it choriocarcinoma so all the four options are of malignancies so there is a malignancy in the testes right see the age of the boy and see the biggest clue the afp is normal afp is normal so only in one of the germ cell tumor the afp is normal can you tell me the name of that germ cell tumor in which the afp is normal alpha beta protein levels are normal what is the correct answer yes here yeah, the correct answer is seminoma you all are right now it's time to see the testicular tumors in detail so how many types of testicular tumors you know there are two types of testicular tumors germ cell and non germ cell the germ cell arises from the of course germ cell of the testes right so there are two types of testicular tumor let me come on testicular tumors what are the two types of testicular tumors the germ cell tumor germ cell tumors known as gct and non germ cell tumors non germ cell tumors known as non gcts the gcts are of six types what are the six types of gcts can you please tell me what are the six types of gcts there is a mnemonic the mnemonic is y e s p c t yes p c t so it's yolk sac it's embryonal it's seminoma it's polyembryoma choriocarcinoma and teratoma okay among the non germ cell you will get leddig cell and sertoli cell leddig and sertoli so learn the classification first now among this classification among the germ cell tumor seminoma is different from all others how it is different number 1 in seminoma the alpha fetoprotein levels are normal and in all others the afp is raised number 1 number 2 seminoma prognosis is good you know metastasis is late in all others prognosis is poor because metastasis is very early right number 3 seminoma respond to chemo uh, chemotherapy and radiotherapy it is very radio sensitive and chemotherapy chemo sensitive so the treatment of choice is radiotherapy and chemotherapy followed by surgery but all other are radio resistant chemo resistant direct treatment is surgery only so that is the difference so how many testicular tumors you know germ cell non germ cell in the germ cell they, you have, there are six options what are the six options we will see the classification again it's y e s y e s p c t so y stands for yolk sac e stands for embryonal s stands for seminoma p stands for polyoma polyembryoma it is not given here c stands for choriocarcinoma and t stands for teratoma right and in non germ cell tumor it's leddig and sertoli right so seminoma is different and it is the most common tumor of the testes most common malignant tumor of the testes in females the corresponding portion is known as disc germinoma okay it constitute 45% of total germ cell tumor among the yes pct total tumors seminoma constitute 45% seminoma constitute 45% grossly the testes are enlarged if you see the testes and cut from the center and open like a open book you can see where is the tumor the entire testes is converted into tumor the entire testes converted into the tumor the normal testes is pushed to the periphery can you see this is the normal testes can you see this is the normal testes the normal testes is pushed to the periphery and you can see the entire testes have the tumor the tumor is yellowish homogeneous and it is multi lobated the word multi lobated is very important multi lobated 
it's multilobated having multiple small small lobules okay so there is homogeneous grayish white lobulated appearance of the entire testes the entire testes are enlarged coming on the microscopy in the microscopy this is the diagram can you see the entire uh, tumor you can see the multiple lobules where are the lobules let me draw the lobules this is a lobule this is a lobule all these are the lobule which are divided by septa these all are septa which are dividing the testes into multiple portions these are known as lobules so lobules are divided by septa can you see now inside that try to appreciate the tumor cell these are the tumor cells can you see these are the tumor cells these are the tumor cells so how are the tumor cells the tumor cells are enlarged let me tell you the tumor cells just a second the tumor cells are enlarged number 1 with a clear cytoplasm with a prominent central nucleus and inside the nucleus there is a central nucleoli see this is cell see the cytoplasm is clear see the nucleus and inside the nucleus appreciate the nucleoli the prominent nucleoli so that is the tumor cells what about the cells present on the septa which cells are present on the septa can you see the septa try to appreciate the cells present on the septa this is septa see the cells on the septa on the septa lymphocytes are present these are not tumor cells and it is a hallmark lymphocytic infiltration of the septa septa contains lymphocyte it is a hallmark of seminoma so how does the diagram of the seminoma look like we will draw a square inside that we try to make the multiple lobules hai na with the help of the septa this is all septa right this is all septa we are drawing now inside the septa we would we would try to draw the lymphocytes we will label it as lymphocytic infiltration like that and in the lobules we will draw the tumor cells the tumor cells are large with a nucleus with a prominent nucleoli large nucleus prominent nucleoli like that large nucleus with a prominent nucleoli so it's typical seminoma right so grossly you have to learn the lobules the tumor cells are uniform clear cytoplasm they have well defined borders the nucleus is at the center and prominent nucleoli is there and in the stroma in the septa it's fibrous tissue it contains lymphocytic infiltration right human markers alpha fetoprotein is normal and human hcg right uh, human chorionic gonadotropin uh, is also normal both the levels are normal so which which tumor markers are raised in seminoma it's kit oct and plab kit oct and plab so it's kit it's oct4 and plab it's placental alkaline phosphatase placental alkaline phosphatase plab is raised okay so that prognosis is better i told you as compared to other uh, germ cell tumor from yes pcd non seminoma wale so it is better and it is radio sensitive and chemo sensitive right coming on the next question i guess uh, the topic testicular tumor is very clear to you so coming on the next question the next question is in front of you let me come on the next question there is a lady has been diagnosed with a breast cancer okay her biopsy report revealed the presence of the tumor cells with signet ring appearance the biggest clue given to you is the signet ring appearance and indian file pattern so what is the most common diagnosis is it invasive lobular carcinoma invasive ductal carcinoma medullary cancer or mucinous yes so the correct answer is invasive lobular carcinoma because of why the correct answer is um, uh, medulla uh, this invasive uh, lobular carcinoma because of uh, this indian file pattern so what is this indian file pattern i will tell you everything about the breast cancer so let's start the breast cancer topic in detail you definitely get a question on this it's a very important very ultra important topic very frequently we get question on this okay so let's start the breast cancer let's start breast cancer okay breast cancers are of two type non invasive or invasive the non invasive one also known as carcinoma in situ okay now each of them are two type ductal lobular ductal lobular okay so let me tell you the full form this is ductal carcinoma in situ lobular carcinoma in situ both of them are carcinoma in situ na this one is invasive ductal carcinoma invasive lobular carcinoma so for understanding this basically you have to understand the structure of a female breast right we are talking about the female breast the breast cancer frequently occurs in female breast very rarely a male male patient can have a breast cancer so let me draw a breast of a female to explain you the diagram to explain you the structure in the entire breast small small lobules are present small small acini ductules or lobules are present so let me show you small ductules acini okay these are present now from them small small terminal ducts are coming out these all are terminal ducts okay these are the ducts and these are opening in terminal ducts just a second this is a terminal duct this is a terminal duct this is a terminal duct in the terminal duct these ductules and lobules are opening okay these so all the ductules and lobules just suppose these three are opening in one terminal duct so they form a lobule this is one lobule 
This one is one lobule. This one is one lobule. So one lobule means one lobule means all the SC narrow ductules opening in one terminal duct. Now multiple terminal duct combine together and they open in lacticiferous duct. This is a lacticiferous duct in which this is this is this is opening. What is the function of breast? The breast is a non-functional organ, but it is functional only during lactation. Whenever the lady is lactating a baby, breastfeeding the baby, at that time the breast is functional and milk synthesis and ejection occurs inside the breast. Okay, so who synthesizes the milk? So milk synthesis occurs inside the ductules or SNI like this. Okay, inside the ductules and SNI, the milk uh, is synthesized. Okay, by the cells. Okay, so the milk will go in the terminal duct and from the terminal duct, it will come in the lobule, uh, it will come in the lactiferous duct and finally in the nipple. So whenever the baby is sucking the uh, nipple of the mother, the milk will go in the mouth of the baby. This is how the functionality of the breast is there, right? This is functional. So now let me tell you how does the breast cancer appear. So breast cancer first appear inside the ductular lobule. These are the tumor cells I am drawing. These are the tumor cells I am drawing. Till the tumor cells are present inside the ductule, it is ductal. It is ductal, right? One duct is involved, right? Only one duct is involved. It is not coming outside. It is not rupturing and coming outside. So it is carcinoma in C2. Carcinoma in C2 means it is present inside the ductules only, right? And one lobule is involved. So lobule, lobular is there. So it can be ductal, it can be lobular. Depending one duct is involved or complete lobule. Now you can see this is one complete lobule. This is one complete. So whether one duct is involved or complete lobule is involved. Now still it is carcinoma in C2. Both of them are carcinoma in C2. Once the tumor cell rupture it and come in the background, tumor cell is rupturing, coming out in the background stroma, it is known as invasive. So you can understand what is, what is carcinoma in C2, what is invasive. So the breast cancers are of two types. As I told you, what are the two types of breast cancer? Non-invasive and invasive. Okay. The non-invasive also known as carcinoma in C2. Here the tumor cells are present within the ductules or lobules. They are not coming in the stroma. They are not rupturing. Here the tumor cells have ruptured the ductules and lobules and they are present in the background stroma also. Right. Both of them are of 2-2 two -two type depending duct, duct is involved or lobule is involved. Here also duct is involved or lobule is involved. Right. This is known as ductal carcinoma in C2. This one is known as lobular carcinoma in C2. This one is known as invasive ductal carcinoma. This one is known as invasive lobular carcinoma. I hope the concept is crystal clear to you. Now I'm going to give you diagram of all four so that you can understand in our question the Indian file pattern was mentioned. What do you mean by Indian file pattern and why the answer is invasive lobular ILC, right? You can see the options. It is ILC, it is IDC. This one is medullary and mucinous. These are miscellaneous tumors, okay? So let me tell you the first in C2 carcinoma. Okay. The two type of in C2 carcinoma, let me tell you. One is ductal in C2 carcinoma. One is lobular in C2 carcinoma. Ductal in C2 carcinoma and lobular in C2 carcinoma. The ductal in C2 carcinoma is of four types. Let me explain the four types to you. The one is solid, then comedo, then papillary, then cribriform. What do you mean by solid? You can see a ductule. This is a ductule, this is a ductule, this is a ductule and this is a ductule. Now inside the ductule, the tumor cells are present. The tumor cells are present throughout. Let me show you just a second. The tumor cells are present throughout, pack to pack in a solid pattern. Can you see? Pack to pack in a solid pattern, it is present throughout. This one is solid, right? In the comedo, the tumor cells are present at the periphery. The tumor cells are present at the periphery and in the center, there is a necrosis. This is known as comedo. Okay. In the papillary, the tumor cells are arranged in papilla-like projection. What is papilla? It's finger-like projection. You can see it's finger-like projection. Okay. And in cuneiform, cuneiform is it's like a sieve. The cuneiform is like a sieve. Channi ke jasa hai. It's like a sieve. The cuneiform is like a sieve. Okay. So that is the DCIS. You can see the four patterns of the DCIS. Right. But in LCIS, Lobular carcinoma in C2, we have only one pattern that is solid. You can see this one is solid, this one is also solid. This one. But there is a difference. See both the solids. Let me show you. Let me show you the difference. Here also you can see it's solid pattern. The tumor cells are arranged back to back throughout. Now please see the cells here. They are small, they are compact. And see the cells here. They are loosely arranged. They are little bit less cohesive and loose from each other. They are uniform and larger. So that is the difference. So what we have learned? We have learned the two type of in C2 carcinoma of breast. In C2, carcinoma in C2. Okay, this is ductal carcinoma in C2. This is lobular carcinoma in C2. 
here four patterns are there here only one pattern is there what are the four patterns here it's solid it's comedo it's a papillary and it's cribri form okay and here only one pattern is there that is solid we would like to draw diagram for all of them so let's draw the ductules for all of them inside the ductules we would like to draw the tumor cells here in compact it's completely filled and now here also solid may it's compactly filled the only thing here they are packed and here they are loosely arranged okay in comedo the tumor cells are present at the periphery only at the periphery at the center there is a necrosis in the papillary the tumor cells are arranged in papilla like pattern okay in cribri form the tumor cells is like a sieve hindi mein kahun to channi ke jaisa hai so that is the pattern we have seen we have seen the diagram you get many questions on that now coming on the invasive one the two type of the invasive right invasive ductal and invasive lobular let me show you the back to back can you see the two diagrams back to back here you can see this is a ductule having the comedo dcis you can see a ductule having the solid dcis here it is a lobule having the solid having the solid right both of them are invasive now i am talking now in invasive the tumor cells will rupture and breach and come in the stroma so here also the tumor cells are coming out and now in the background stroma and here also the tumor cells are coming out in the background stroma where are the tumor cells here in ductal one the tumor cells maybe are in clusters maybe they are singly maybe in the form of a circular gland there is no fixed pattern but in invasive lobular one when they are coming out in the stroma they are one behind the other they are one behind the other ek ke piche ek hai they are one behind the other one behind the other like this forming a train forming a train okay one behind the other this pattern is known as indian file pattern what do you mean by indian file the meaning of the indian file is one behind the other the meaning of the indian file is one behind the other look at here and look at here so you tell me the indian file pattern is seen in invasive lobular carcinoma that is our answer now right now i'm going to the next question we have seen everything about the breast cancer going to the next question next question is in front of you can you tell me histological examination of a bone tumor is given to you what is the diagnosis so look at the bone tumor is it osteosarcoma is it a giant cell tumor is it a ewing sarcoma or is it a chondrosarcoma the question is very simple the question is very very simple can you tell me the answer yes can you please tell me the answer what is the answer here yes so you all can see they have multiple giant cells can you see what is a giant cell a tumor cell having more than one nucleus i mean multiple nucleus it is a giant cell in most of the cells you can see multiple giant cell it's a giant cell tumor it's a giant cell tumor the common age is ages 20 to 40 years here age is not given it is common in females it is common at the epiphyses of the bone it is more common in the femur followed by tibia it is usually solitary okay coming on the next question now it was a small question now coming on the next question The next question: There is a female presented with multiple warty lesions around the vulva, warty lesions along around the genitalia, around the vulva, and they are gradually increasing. They are soft, they are sessile, they don't bleed on touch. So it is a typical case of one of the sexually transmitted disease in a female STD. So the clues given to you: multiple lesions are there. It's not one. They are soft, they are sessile, and they do not bleed. is it condyloma acuminata bowen disease condyloma lata or hemorrhoids so what is the correct answer it's typically a case of condyloma acuminata which occurs due to human papilloma virus 6 and 11 so human papilloma virus are of hundreds of type but some of them are low risk some of them are high risk the low risk one causes the benign disease the high risk one causes the malignant disease among the low risk one the most important is 6 and 11 among the high risk one it's 16 18 here the 6 and 11 on the genitalia in males as well as in females they form multiple big large lesions and that is known as condyloma acuminata that is our answer right now you can see can you see here the vulva of a female having a big lesion looking like a cauliflower coming out of the vagina okay the vagina and the vulva and it's benign it's benign it is known as condyloma condyloma acuminata it's condyloma acuminata it is caused by human papilloma virus hpv the benign one it is caused by low risk that is 6 and 11 okay so let's study the hpv in detail as i told you there are many type of hpv there are 70 type of hpv some of them are low risk and some of them are high risk the low risk one are benign and the high risk one causes malignant disease in the benign they cause warts that is known as condyloma acuminata in the malignancy they cause malignancy of the genitalia what is the reason how does they cause the malignancy do you know the reason do you know the reason let me tell you something 
So just draw a human cell, a human genital cell. This is the nucleus of the human cell. This is a host cell. By host, I mean human. Okay. And this is the DNA. Okay. This is the DNA. When a HPV virus, imagine this is a HPV virus, enters inside, the HPV virus form two proteins. This is the virus. It form two proteins, E6 and E7. E6 and E7, both of them go in the nucleus and they mutate various genes. E6 causes mutation of P53 and E7 causes mutation of retinoblastoma. Okay. E6 causes mutation of P53 and TERT. And E7 causes mutation of retinoblastoma and P21, if you can learn. Okay. The four mutation will cause uncontrolled mitosis in the cell, which will lead to cancer, the benign and the malignant cancer. So this is the pathogenesis. You get many questions from this. Okay. Repeated question. E6, E7. E6 is uh, inhibiting what? It is causing the mutation of the P53 and TERT. And E7 is causing the mutation of P21 and retinoblastoma. It is causing immortalization to the cell. That is, the cell will not die and uncontrolled cell division is there. Increased cell proliferation leading to cancer. Right. Now, coming on the next question. Can you identify the organism given in the image? Very easy question. You can give a guess. Can you please identify the organism given in the smear? What is the correct answer? Yes. The organism shown in the image. What is the correct answer? Yes, who can tell me the answer? Just a second, give me a minute. Yes. So you can see in this diagram, the RBCs are shown to you. Many RBCs are shown to you. And inside these RBCs, you can see the ring-like structures. Can you see the ring-like structures inside the RBC? All the four options are of plasmodium. The plasmodium parasite. It's a malaria parasite. But there are four types of plasmodium. Now, so which one is shown to you? Is it falciferum? Is it vivax? Is it ovale or malaria? I guess the question is very simple and most of you know the answer. The answer is plasmodium falciferum. Now, why the plasmodium falciferum is the answer? Only one clue is given to you. Here... Inside the RBC, some of the RBC show multiple ring. Multiple rings are possible only in falciferum, not in others. The others show one ring in one RBC. But here in this RBC, I can see two. In this RBC also, I can see the two rings. And in this RBC, I can see a, a cold form. The headphone appearance is known as a cold form. These all clues are pointing towards plasmodium falciferum. So the correct answer here is plasmodium falciferum. So let me explain you the various morphological features of the various types of the plasmodium. How many types of plasmodium are there? There are four types of plasmodium, vivax, falciferum, malaria and ovale. You have to learn this in this sequence only. You cannot change the sequence. How you will learn in the sequence? I am having a mnemonic for you. The mnemonic is very, V for very, F for fantastic, very fantastic medical officer. Okay, very fantastic, very fantastic medical officer. VFMO, very fantastic medical officer. That is the mnemonic. Okay, now you will not change the sequence and in this sequence only you have to learn. It's very fantastic medical officer. VFMO, very fantastic medical officer. Now each of them, for each of them we will discuss the various morphological forms. So you have to tell me early trophozoite of each of them. How does it look like? You have to tell me, tell me the late trophozoite of each of them. How does it look like? Okay. You have to tell me the gametes. Gametes of each of them. The gametes. The male and female. How does it look like? So, these are intracellular parasites. They remain inside the RBC. So, let me draw the RBCs. Let me draw the RBCs. And let me draw the RBCs. Okay. Now, inside the RBCs, let me draw the early trophozoite form. In the early trophozoite form, it's a ring structure. Ring with a nucleus. Have you seen a ring? Ring with a diamond. So, it's the ring. It's like ring. It's like ring. So in vivax, malaria and oval, one RBC have one ring. But in falciferum, one RBC can have multiple, multiple ring. Multiple ring in one RBC, that was our question right now. Okay, multiple ring in one RBC, you can find. Okay, what is the diamond in the ring? The diamond is the nucleus of the parasite which is shifted to the periphery. The diamond in the ring is the nucleus of the parasite which is shifted to the periphery looking like a diamond. Right, so that is the thing. Number two, in falciferum, sometimes you can get two diamonds in one ring. It's like headphone appearance, right? It's like this. So you, this is known as a coal. So you will find a coal forms also. The a coal forms are also present. Coming on the late, late trophozoite, in the late trophozoite in Vivex, it is amoeboid shaped, amoeba shape. You can see I'm drawing the amoeba shape like this. Okay, falciferum is same, the multiple rings. Malaria is like band form. This is the band. And ovale is again ring form. Okay, coming on the gametes, how does their gametes are there? Gametes are spherical in all of them except falciferum which have banana shaped gametes. Now either you say banana shape here 
or you say sickle shape here so banana or sickle shape gametes are possible in the falciparum you got it so i guess everyone have got it so the same thing is given to you now see the early trophozoite of all of them can you see here one rbc one ring one rbc one ring one rbc one ring but see the falciparum one rbc having multiple ring and one of them is a cold if you notice this one is a cold okay now come on the late trophozoite of all of them see in vivax it's amoeba shape and in malaria it's band the remaining two are same like the ring right see the gamete the male and female gamete the gamete is always a sphere always a sphere 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 except falciparum where it can be banana okay except here where it can be banana or sickle shape now one more thing i would like to tell you here the name of the uh, pigment it's schaffner dot morer dot zeman dot and james dot you got it so in vivax it's schaffner dot in falciparum it's morer dot in maleri it's zeman dot and in oval it's james dot can you see here what is this dots i'm talking about see the rbcs here i'm highlighting see the rbcs can you see the rbcs here please see the rbcs can you see the rbcs just a second now in the rbcs can you see the background of the rbc the background of the rbc have some dot like structure now it's the pigment present in the cytoplasm so name that pigment when so it's uh, it's schaffner dot in vivax it's morer dot in falciparum it's zeman dot in maleri and james dot in oval so you have to learn so how you will learn you will say ma'am it's very difficult to learn which one is having which dots and you frequently get pyqs on that so i'm having a mnemonic for you what was our first mnemonic what was our first, first mnemonic very fantastic medical officer this was our first mnemonic now i'm giving you mnemonic for the dots so the mnemonic is c more zebra in the jungle okay c more zebra in the jungle so how you will say s for schaffner dot m for morer dot z for zeman dot and j j for uh, what is the j james dot so you frequently get questions on that so we are done with plasmodium any question coming from the plasmodium you can answer either in patho or micro wherever or in medicine now coming on the next question there is a patient for organ transplant right he has a twin brother who is the perfect match for this right which type of grafting is it is it isograft allograft autograft or xenograft the question is very very simple can you please answer it what is the correct answer yes the question is super duper simple is it isograft allograft autograft or xenograft yes the correct answer is the isograft so in a transplant there is a donor there is a recipient the recipient is the host the donor is the one who is giving the graft right that is the donor and the recipient is one who is receiving the graft and graft is the thing which we are transferring from one living individual to another living individual right so two ot's run parallel especially in the same sitting same hospital preferably if the same sitting same hospital is not um, um, available we will try to do it as soon as possible i mean we will take out the organ or the graft out of the donor and immediately shift it to the recipient so two doctors team two surgeons team is required the first team working on the donor the second team working on the recipient right so that is the thing now who is the donor based on that the transplant is of four types who is the donor who is the donor sometimes the donor is the self person the donor is the self person how is it possible the self person suppose someone is having burns over the skin over the face so skin is taken from the back or the thigh and plastic surgery is done on the skin right so who is the donor the self who is the recipient the self so that graft is the best graft and it is known as autograft auto you know auto matlab self autograft or autogenic graft no chance of rejection 100% acceptance kyunki rejection ka sawal hi nahi hai na it is the same antigen same person okay same epitopes second is isograft right now the autograft is not possible always na so uh, if autograft the self is not possible so who is the best donor the best donor is the identical twin and now monozygous twin identical twin it is not non identical twin the identical twin have same genetic makeup so if anyone is having the identical twin that is the best donor for that person because chances of rejection will be nil because the genetic makeup of the two person is same but it is not say true for the non identical twin okay the third now everyone don't have twin the identical twin i don't have identical twin so if any person require a graft and self is not possible identical twin is not there so anyone from the same species can give the can give the graft like can be the donor so any human will work any human it can be a relative it can be a friend it can be a non relative unknown person but it should be a human if multiple donors are there multiple options are there you should check the hla of all of them so maximum matching is there you should go with that donor okay that is known as allograft 
The third graft is known as allograft. And last, the worst graft is xenograft. Xenograft is from different species. It is not performed nowadays from different species. Like from cow or monkey, you can do the transplant or some other animal. So worse, 100% rejection is there, right? So rejection is not there in auto and iso. These are the best graft, but rejection can be there in allo and xeno. So rejection is more in xeno as compared to allo. So can you tell me what are the types of the graft? Autograft, isograft, allograft, and xenograft. Tell me who is the donor. In autograft, the donor is the self. In isograft, the donor is the identical twin. Identical twin. In allograft, any person from the same species. Same species. And in xenograft, it is different species. Any person or any human, I mean any animal from the different species. Right. So that is the four types of the graft. Now read your question very carefully. There is a person who requires an organ transplant and he is having a twin brother, the identical twin who is the perfect match. So it is isograft. It is isograft. Right. So if I instead of the twin, if I use any human, any human from the same species, answer will become allo. And if I use different species, answer will become xeno. And if I use the self, answer will become auto. So you frequently get questions on these four very, very, very frequently. Next question we are coming, owl eye inclusions are seen in. Can you please tell me the answer? Owl eye inclusions are seen in. Yes, what is the correct answer? Is it HSV, HHV, HBV or CMV, cytomegalovirus? Human simplex virus, HHV virus, Ipsin bar virus or cy cytomegalovirus? Of course, the owl eye appearance is seen in cytomegalovirus. In cytomegalovirus, the inclusion bodies are seen in the cytoplasm as well as nucleus as well as nucleus. In the cytoplasm as well as nucleus, the inclusion bodies are seen. So can you see, this is the cell. Inside the cell, can you see, these are the nucleus. Inside the nucleus, can you see the nucleoli, I am sorry, the inclusion bodies are there. So inclusion bodies present in the cytoplasm, the inclusion bodies present in the nucleus also giving an owl eye appearance. Now in all our appearance, you get three questions. Owl eye appearance of the cell occurs in cytomegalovirus, okay, due to the inclusion bodies. Right, it is cytomegalovirus. Sometime owl eye appearance of the entire nucleus is seen. Can you see the nucleus? The cell is not owl eye. These are the two nucleus. Both of them have a nucleoli. It is typical RS cell. It is seen in RS cell, the classical RS cell. Right, sometime in radiology, you see the uh, owl eye appearance. CT of a person with owl eye appearance, right? It is seen in central hypoxia. Central hypoxia, you can see. Can you see here? Typical owl eye appearance. Let me highlight. So, owl eye appearance means three questions, three answers. Sometimes you get a owl eye appearance of the cell, the entire cell. Answer is inclusion bodies, cytomegalovirus. Entire nucleus, our answer is RS cell. And it is seen radiographically in the CT image, in the lentiform nucleus, it is due to hypoxia. So, please learn it very, very, very carefully coming on the next question. What is the next question here? The next question, there is a person working with a 30-year history of working in a cardboard factory, not developed breathlessness and the mottling of the lung. So, what is the disease? So, it is a question of pneumoconiosis. What is pneumoconiosis? So, the person develops pneumonia or respiratory difficulty due to their occupational hazard. So, the person is a worker in cardboard industry since last 30 years. So, is it bisinosis, bagosis, asbestosis or nasopharyngeal carcinoma? What do you say? What is the correct answer here? What do you say? Yes, the correct answer here is the bagosis. So, you have to learn this table very, very, very carefully. Right? So, due to the coal dust, if someone is working in coal mine, so due to the coal dust, the person have respiratory disease known as anthracosis. The miner who work in mine and uh, who are in close contact to the asbestos, they have asbestosis. The one who work in the sand or stone cutting factory, so, he is in contact with silica. So, the person will have silicosis. The one who is having cardboard or paper factory or sugar factory. So, that is in contact with bagasse and it is known as bagosis. That was our question right now. And the person who is working in a uh, textile industry. You know, cotton industry, cloth industry, textile industry. So, he is in contact with cotton and it is known as bisinosis. Now, most of the students have always have confusion between bagosis and bisinosis. So, please learn it very carefully. The correct answer here is the bagosis, not bisinosis. Okay. I hope you got it. I hope you got it. Okay. So, can we go ahead? So, the next question is in front of you. Let me read the question. Which of the following is correct despite a uh, description for the type of the heart lesion in the patient with the rheumatic arthritis? In the patient with rheumatic arthritis, does the patient have osseous nodes or the patient have McCallum patch or the patient have floppy walls or the patient have myxematous degeneration? 
So what is the correct answer? Of course, the correct answer is the McCallum patch. So it's time to understand the rheumatic fever completely. What is rheumatic fever? How many of you knows what is rheumatic fever? Let me explain you what is rheumatic fever. Can you see this is a diagram? In this diagram, this person is a child. Because rheumatic fever more commonly occurs in children, that's why I'm saying this person is a child. Now this child is having tonsillitis. You know, tonsillitis is very common. Tonsillitis, pharyngitis. We also have multiple episodes of tonsillitis. <coughs> or pharyngitis since we were a kid okay everyone have experienced this episode the tonsillitis tell me the name of the bacteria which most commonly causes tonsillitis it is group a beta streptococcus bacteria group a beta streptococcus pharyngitis it is known as gas bacteria group a streptococcus group a beta streptococcus pharyngitis right so that is a tonsillitis it is causing okay right the tonsillitis it is causing now what is the problem here the body is forming antibodies against the bacteria these are the antibodies the body is forming antibodies against the bacteria. You will see, ma'am, what is the problem in that? Whenever any foreign particle, foreign thing enters in human body, whether a bacteria, virus, fungus or parasite, the body forms the antibodies against that. So what is the problem in that? The body is forming antibodies. It's okay. The antibody will go combined with the bacteria. Antigen antibody complexes will be formed and the bacteria will be destroyed. It will be killed because of the phagocytosis. Okay, what is the problem in that? No problem with the bacteria. But the problem is that the bacteria contain a epitope on that. The bacteria, the cell wall of this bacteria contain a protein known as M protein. The similar M protein on, is present on human five organs. Which human five organs? It is present on human heart. It is present on human brain. Let's take the two vital, the heart and the brain. On the heart, the brain, the skin. The next is the skin. Okay. The heart, the brain, the skin. Just below the skin, it's subcutaneous tissue. And below that, we have joints. Okay. So, let's say the five organs, the heart, the brain, the skin, the subcutaneous tissue and the joints. On all of them, you can see the M protein is present. So, basically, these antibodies will get confused. So, actually, these antibodies are formed for the M protein of the bacteria. But they will get confused. They will cross-react. They will confuse and they will cross-react with the M protein of the five organ. With the M protein, they will think it is also a bacteria. So actually antibodies don't understand this is bacteria, this is own organ. They are formed against M protein. So wherever they find the M protein, they will bind and they will destroy that tissue. So they destroy the bacteria, but they destroy human five organs also. So they cause five diseases in the five organ. Can you name the five diseases? Let me tell you. So in the heart, in the heart, they cause rheumatic heart disease. In the brain, they cause sendam scoria. In the skin, they cause erythema marginatum. In the subcutaneous tissue, they cause subcutaneous nodules. And in the joints, they cause migratory polyarthritis. Now, these five diseases together known as rheumatic fever. So, my point is that rheumatic fever is not one disease. It is an umbrella term having five diseases under that. Rheumatic fever is not one disease. It is an umbrella term having five diseases under that. Right? So, that is rheumatic fever. It is due to autoantibodies. Now, who is causing the destruction of the five organ? Is it bacteria coming and causing the destruction of the five organ? No, 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 no. It is not the bacteria which is causing destruction of these five organ. It is the antibodies. I mean to say it is the autoantibodies. So, why it is autoantibodies? Because these antibodies is destroying human own tissue. And this disease is known as rheumatic fever. Here, heart. I will discuss only heart here. Right? Now, in the heart, there are three layers. Now, what are the three layers of the heart? Endocardium, myocardium, pericardium. So, the M protein is present on all, all the three layers. Endocardium, myocardium, epicardium, right? Pericardium. So, the antibodies causes destruction of all three layers. So, patient have endocarditis, patient have myocarditis, patient have pericarditis and this is known as pancarditis. So, basically in rheumatic fever, patient have pancarditis. I repeat my words, patient have pancarditis, I mean to say all the three layers of the heart are inflamed. It's not only endocarditis, not only myocarditis, not only pericarditis, it's all three together. We are talking about rheumatic fever. So in rheumatic fever, the heart is involved. Heart is one of the five organs. It is involved. In the heart, all three layers are involved. You can see the walls are involved, endocardium, the myocardium, the pericardium, everything is involved. So we will discuss them in detail. Okay, now in the endocardium, I told you there are two types of endocardium. The valvular endocardium and the mural endocardium. The endocardium which is present on the walls of the heart, the bicuspid wall, mitral wall, hana, and tricuspid wall, it is valvular endocardium. And the endocardium which is present in the three-dimensional rest of the heart, it is known as mural endocardium, right? Now, we will see endocarditis first. What is happening in the endocarditis? In the walls, the vegetations are formed. Can you see the vegetations? Please appreciate the vegetations. Please appreciate the vegetations here. Okay, can you see the vegetations here? The vegetations here, the vegetations are there, small, small. This is known as valvular endocarditis, right? In the mural endocarditis in the left auricle, you know heart have four chambers, the two auricles, the two ventricles, both right side and left side. 
in the left auricle there is a patch of wrinkling there is a patch of wrinkling a wrinkled patch is there that is known as macellum patch what is it known as it is known as macellum patch okay macellum patch is there so that macellum patch is the mural endocarditis so valvular endocarditis vegetations are there mural endocarditis macellum patch it is a patch of wrinkling in the mural endocardium that was our question right now in the myocardium you can see multiple eschkoff bodies are formed in the myocardium multiple granulomas are formed and these granulomas are known as eschkoff bodies can you see multiple granulomas are there in the entire myocardium multiple granulomas are there and that is known as eschkoff bodies okay and in the pericardium in the pericardium it is known as bread and butter appearance what do you mean by bread and butter have you ever eaten bread butter sandwich huh in the breakfast no so see what happens in bread butter you see you take two slices of the bread and in between them there is butter right have you ever tried the separating the two bread slices away from each other if you have not tried please do so if you try to separate the two slices of the bread away from each other you can see the strings you can see the strings of butter in between you can see the strings of butter in between this is known as bread and butter appearance so basically in the heart this is endocardium this is myocardium and this is pericardium now the space this space is known as pericardial space so normally in pericardial space a small amount of fluid is present which is known as pericardial fluid so normal pericardial fluid is serous in nature serous means it's watery in nature but what happens now in rheumatic carditis this pericarditis become fibrinous this fluid become fibrinous in nature it is known as fibrinous pericarditis fibrinous pericarditis what do you mean by fibrinous what do you mean by the word fibrinous the word fibrinous means it is thready hindi mein kahun to dhagedar it become thready thready in appearance So what happened? Imagine the child is dead of rheumatic fever. You are doing the autopsy of the child. So what you will do? You will take the heart out. Once you take the heart out to see the all the three layers of the heart. First, you cut the pericardium and separate it from the myocardium. So as soon as with the help of a scissor, you are cutting the pericardium and separating it with the myocardium. You can see the threads in between, like the two slices of the bread, and you can see the threads of the butter in between. So this appearance is known as bread and butter appearance. So it is known as bread and butter appearance. or uh, fibrinous pericarditis so can you please summarize me what is happening in rheumatic fever in rheumatic fever the five organs are involved currently i am interested in heart i am interested in heart so in the heart all three layers are involved the endocardium is also involved myocardium is also involved pericardium is involved also involved in the endocardium there are two types of endocardium the valvular endocardium okay the valvular endocardium and mural endocardium okay now you tell me the lesions everywhere in the valvular endocardium vegetations are formed in the mural endocardium there is a patch of wrinkling in the left auricle it is known as macellum patch macellum patch is important in the myocardium granulomas are formed which are known as eschkoff bodies okay and in the pericardium it's fibrinous pericardium fibrinous pericardium which is known as bread and butter appearance bread and butter appearance so this is the summary and you get many questions on that believe me you can see everything here see the endocardium myocardium pericardium see the pancarditis this is typically pancarditis okay now before moving on the next question let me tell you something now i get i get many questions many queries from the students uh, throughout the day daily i get right the most common question students ask me frequently ma'am what are the ideal hours of study to get a good rank So most of the students are, of course, everyone want to get a good rank in the exam. Of course, everyone wish to do so. So they ask, what are the ideal hours? How many hours we uh, study per day, and the selection is guaranteed. So do you really think it's the quantity of time that matters? Do you really think so? Let me give you two examples. Imagine there are two children. There is first child. There is first student. who is studying for 12 hours 15 hours in a day right but with full distraction on multiple social media platform throughout the day right so there is uh, you know instagram there is whatsapp there is telegram there is twitter there is youtube there is facebook so multiple distractions are there but the sitting is good it's 15 hours 17 hours maybe right but there, on the contrary there is another student who is very smart and studying only 6 to 8 hours a day the sitting is only 6 to 8 hours a day with full dedication without any distraction not using any other social media platform during those hours so at the end of the day you yourself compare that whose output will be better is it the first student or second student you yourself decide 
So it is not the quantity of time only matters. Of course, quantity of time matters. You say, ma'am, I study for one hour. Is it sufficient? No, it's not sufficient. At least you should study for six to eight hours daily. Being a medical student, it is expected from you. So average students study for that. But if you are studying smartly with without any distraction, with full dedication, these many hours are sufficient. So it is the quality of time you are dedicating, right? So it depends on you. If you are giving a good quality, so less number of hours, and both are inversely proportional. If you give a good quality of time, the quantity is less required. If you give a bad quality, more quantities required so you yourself decide what you want so my 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 you know advice to all of you whenever you are studying just study and whenever you are not studying not study do not predict or pretend that you are studying at that time if you want to uh, do some entertainment so do full entertainment at that time right don't try to study at that time and if you are studying study don't do entertainment so this principle will work if you follow believe me and we go to the next question yes we should move to the next question the next question is in front of you. Can you read the next question? There is a 70 year old patient. So see the age. Age is always a clue. Having a lesion over the two years. Lesion over the face from two years. For two years. What is the diagnosis? See the image. In the image you can see the, the lesion. You can see the lesion. The lesion is in the teardrop fashion. Right here in this location of the face. Is it basal cell carcinoma? squamous cell carcinoma, malignant melanoma or keratoacanthoma. So what is the diagnosis? It is one of the malignancy. See the age and typical is the image. See the image and tell me the diagnosis. It's a spotter. What is the correct answer? What is the correct answer? Yes, the correct answer is basal cell carcinoma. Right, basal cell carcinoma, the underlying risk factors are albinism, arsenic, you know, sorelins, UV rays, UVA rays, tar and xeroderma pigmentosa. The clinical feature, the patient typically have a ulcerative uh, malignancy, ulcerative lesion. It is known as rodent ulcer, ulcerative nodule, right? It is known as rodent ulcer. It occurs on the face in a palisading pattern. Treatment is excision, right? It occurs in middle age or elderly males. Our patient was 70 years old. Coming on the next question. Okay, the next question is in front of you. There is a patient who is died of MI. The patient is, a, is dead of MI, already dead of MI. And his heart is taken out, immersed in a solution. It is immersed in a solution. In that solution, the normal area of the heart turned brick red color. And the infarcted area turned white in color. Can you tell me the name of the solution? In which solution it may be immersed? Is it formalin? Is it TTC? That is triphenyl tetrazoleum chloride. Or is it ethanol or is it glutaraldehyde? What is the correct answer? Can you please tell me what is the correct answer? Is it formalin? Is it triphenyl tetrazoleum chloride? Is it ethanol or is it glutaraldehyde? What is the correct answer? Yes. The correct answer is TTC, triphenyl tetrazoleum chloride. Let me explain you. Imagine a person. A person who is dead. Okay, yes, the person is dead. Right. So what is the cause of the death? Why this person is dead? Right. So, the, there was another person with this person in the room at the time of the death and that person is saying this person was having severe chest pain before death. So, we are predicting MI. But the police is suspecting some foul play. We don't know whether the cause of death is MI or not, a, not an MI. So, the police is bringing the dead body for the post-mortem in the hospital. And you are the doctor. Just suppose I am the doctor. I am performing post-mortem or autopsy. I am performing autopsy on this dead body. So what is my responsibility? My responsibility is that to look for MI very carefully because they are they are suspecting MI. The first suspicion is the MI, the cause of the death. The police want to know the cause of the death. Now I have to take the heart out and I have to look for the MI, whether MI present or absent, right? So that will, I will mention in my autopsy report that the cause of the death is MI or not an MI, MI present or absent. So just suppose I have taken the heart out. This is the heart, I have taken it out. This is the heart. Now, in the entire heart, most commonly, 99% MI occurs in the left ventricle, right? So, this is the left side. This is the right side. Now, this is the left ventricle. You can see it here. This is the entire left ventricle. You can see it here. Now, in the entire left ventricle, where is the MI? In which portion? How you come to know? How you come to know? So, we have to cut the heart in multiple slices. So, you cut the heart in multiple slices like that. Each slice is 0.1. It is 0.1 centimeter thick. So you have you have hundreds of slides with you, right? Each slice, each slice, if you take one of the slice like this and look at this. So each slice have two lumens, right ventricular lumen and left ventricular lumen. 
as i told you most of the mi occur in the wall of the left ventricle so you have to look anterior posterior medial and lateral all the four walls of the left ventricle and look for the mi you will say ma'am it's a very tedious job we have hundreds of slices in each slice we have to look for the four walls around the left ventricle and look for the mi maybe mi is a very small patch present here there sometime it is big it is visible but sometime it is very small it's invisible so what to do in that case what to do in that case so in that case you it's very easy you take a big container and fill it with a dye the name of the dye is ttc that is our question right now give me a minute ttc triphenyl tetrazodium chloride that is the name of the dye right so that is the name of the dye you have to take you have to fill this container with this dye the right it's red color so you have to fill now you take all your slices and dip here i'm drawing only one but you have to take all the slices and dip in this container so this is one of the slice having right ventricle and left ventricle now just suppose this portion is mi let me draw so just suppose this portion is mi this portion right so actually when you dip it now when you dip it so the complete slice will become red the viable area will become red it will take the dye the dye is red in color so the viable area will take the dye and the non viable the dead area will not take the dye the dead area will not take the dye let me show you the dead area is not taking the dye see so the entire slice convert red in color except this area you can see this area is not taking the color it remains white so my point is that my point is that the viable area become red in color and the non viable the dead area become yellow or white in color this is the principle of ttc now you can see all the slices and you can easily make out that this is the dead area now what is the principle you should ask me ma'am why the viable area is red in color and the non viable area is dead the dead area is yellow in color so answer is that in the non viable area we have cells here also and we have cells the here also so here cells are intact they have dehydrogenase enzyme in them but in the dead area the cells are bursted they are lysed they are ruptured so they lose the dehydrogenase enzyme ttc bind with dehydrogenase you tell me where is the pick up of the ttc so the live area will take the ttc because they have dehydrogenase enzyme in them but the dead area will not take ttc because they don't have dehydrogenase enzyme in them the dehydrogenase enzyme is already lost because they are ruptured so that is the principle behind that so that is the complete thing ttc you can see this diagram in this diagram you can see one of the slices the entire slice you can see red color except this portion which is yellow or white so i can make it out this is the dead area that is the infected area and remaining is the viable area so that is the principle behind that that was our question you can read the question again and you can tell me the answer now i guess the concept is crystal clear to you right you can see the normal healthy area is brick, brick red in color and the infected area is the white or yellow in color that is ttc right so the non infected area become red in color because they have the enzyme dehydrogenase enzyme in them dehydrogenase enzyme bind with ttc dye and ttc pick up will be there but the infected area the dead area is yellow or pale in color it doesn't have ttc dye okay so that is the thing coming on the next question next question is in front of you there is a patient presented with the development of seizures for which the ct guided biopsy was done okay the histopathology image shows the presence of samoma body now tell me which brain tumor <clears throat> the patient is having a seizure and all the four options are brain tumor meningioma astrocytoma ependymoma and medulloblastoma the four options are all of them are brain tumor tell me which of the following brain tumor have samoma bodies which of the following brain tumor have samoma bodies can you tell me the answer yes the correct answer is the meningioma in meningioma typically samoma bodies are present right so let me tell you the microscopy of the meningioma meningioma is a brain tumor which arises from the meninges there are three meninges pia meter arachnoid and dura meter the pia meter is the innermost okay let me draw the central nervous system for you so this is brain this is spinal cord rough diagram i am drawing I'll draw it again this is the brain and this is the spinal cord brain and spinal cord they are surrounded by three coverings the three coverings are known as meninges the innermost is the pia meter i am drawing with red color this innermost is the pia meter okay the middle one is the arachnoid i am drawing with blue color the middle one is the arachnoid and the outermost is the dura meter the dura meter is in contact with the skull bone right so we have skull bone here just a second let me draw the skull bone so imagine this is the skull bone so dura meter is just below the skull bone dura meter is just below the skull bone right you can see so this space is known as subarachnoid space let me tell you the space between the pia meter and the arachnoid let me highlight this space 
so let me use the highlighter and let me highlight the space between the pia meter and the arachnoid it is known as subarachnoid space it contains the csf right it always so i guess you know the so among the three managers the arachnoid from the arachnoid meningioma get arise okay now what is the microscopy this is a typical microscopy you can see only tumor so first tell me the arrangement of the tumor cells and then describe each tumor cell and tell me the extra finding what is the arrangement the tumor cells can you see the tumor cells the tumor cells are arranged in world pattern the tumor cells are arranged in world pattern can you see the whirling this is known as world world pattern okay world this is known as world pattern number 1 number 2 say the shape the shape of the tumor cells, cells is spindle shaped they are spindle shaped right number 2 number 2 multiple tumor cells are connected with each other here not very clearly visible like this is a tumor cell ha na this is a tumor cell so they just connect with each other and their nucleus so it is, it is appearing multiple tumor cell as one tumor cell and having multiple nucleus it is known as syncytial it is known as syncytial syncytial means multiple tumor cells are connecting with each other their cell membranes are connecting with each other so there is syncytial appearance right the last thing at the center they have samoma bodies what is samoma bodies at the center of the wall there is samoma samoma body is the calcification they have calcification the calcification is also in world pattern can you see the calcification in a world pattern the calcification in a world pattern the calcification in a world pattern it is known as samoma the p is silent right it is known as samoma so the question was which of the following brain tumor have samoma bodies most frequently so the correct answer is meningioma meningioma most frequently have samoma bodies so the tumor cells are arranged in world pattern the tumor cells are spindeloid they have syncytia and samoma bodies are present at the center of the walls right that is the samoma bodies is the calcification so we are done with this question coming on the next question very quickly the next question is in front of you can you see the next question which of the following mode of inheritance in the patient suffering from color blindness So is it autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, X-linked dominant, or X-linked recessive? So yes, they are asking for color blindness. The correct answer here is X-linked recessive. But what if the question is on tuberous sclerosis? The question is on neurofibromatosis. The question is on you know uh, hemophilia. The so question can be on any disease. So my point is that you should know all four genetic inheritance. There are four type of genetic inheritance. Let's talk about genetic inheritance in a disease. Genetic inher inheritance. okay let's talk about genetic inheritance the four type of genetic inheritance we will talk okay we will talk about autosomal dominance autosomal recessive x linked dominant and x linked recessive so i will give you four mnemonics now you have to learn all the diseases coming in this category in this category in this category in this category currently our question is on color color blindness it can be any question you you frequently or definitely get question on the genetic inheritance so these four mnemonics will be ultra useful for you okay let me start with the first mnemonic The first mnemonic is on autosomal dominant. The mnemonic is wo familial hypercholesteremia autosomal dominant hai. Okay, wo familial hypercholesteremia autosomal dominant hai. So wo 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 stands for von Willebrand disease. Familial ka F stands for familial adenomatous polyposis. Hypercholesteremia stands for hypercholesteremia. Autosomal stands for adult polycystic kidney disease. D dominant ka D stands for dystrophic myotonia. O stands for osteogenesis imperfecta M stands for Marfan syndrome I stands for intermittent porphyria uh, N stands for neurofibromatosis 1 A stands for achondroplasia one more N stands for neurofibromatosis 2 and T stands for tuberous sclerosis okay and H stands for Huntington's disease as well as hereditary spherocytosis I know learning the full form is difficult but with mnemonic it will be easy so it's wo familial hypercholesteremia autosomal dominant dominant hai try to say the full form try to say the full form coming on autosomal recessive what is the mnemonic the mnemonic is a b c d e f g h s p w what is the mnemonic i repeat a b c d e f g h s p w a stands for albinism b stands for beta thalassemia c stands for cystic fibrosis d and color cystic fibrosis that's it d stands for deafness sensory neural deafness as well as dobin dubin johnson e stands for enzyme deficiency like glycogen and lysosomal storage disorder f stands for two thing frederick ataxia and fanconi anemia g stands for galactosemia h stands for hemochromatosis and hurler disease s stands for sickle cell disease p stands for phenylketonuria and w stands for wilson disease 
W stand for Wilson disease, right? The next question, X link dominant. So the answer is fair, F-A-I-R. F stands for facio, facial syndrome, right? Facio oral syndrome. A stands for L port. I stands for incontinenta pigmentosant. R is resistant cricket, right? And last is X in recessive. The mnemonic is Graham Bell. Okay. G stands for G6PD deficiency. R, G R A H A M B E W L. -L. G R stands for retinitis pigmentosa. A stands for androgen insensitivity. H stands for hemophilia. Okay. Uh, a stands for a, a adrenal leukodystrophy. M for N for Manke disease. B for blindness, color blindness, which is our question right now. And it is for back in Duchenne ma muscular dystrophy also. E for Imre Dufus dystrophy. L for Lishnian, one more L for Lowe. I know learning the full form is a little bit difficult, but not impossible. If you try, you can do it. So I told you the four mnemonic, autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, X-link dominant and X-link recessive. I told you the four mnemonics. What are the four mnemonics? Can you tell me? So, what was the mnemonic of autosomal dominant? Wo familial hypercholestremia autosomal dominant. D O M I N A N T. Autosomal dominant. Hai. This is the, try to say the full form. Autosomal recessive A B C D E F G H S P W. This is the mnemonic. Now, coming on uh, X linked dominant. What is the mnemonic? The mnemonic is FAIR. F A I R. Right. And what is the mnemonic of X linked recessive? The mnemonic is Graham Bell. G R A H A M P E W -L, L. Right. I assume you all will read the full form at least once or twice. Don't try to mug up. At least read it before going to your exam. So, any question coming in your exam, you can solve it. Currently, the question was on blindness, color blindness. The answer is excellent processor. You can get multiple questions on these four mnemonics. Believe me. Believe me. Okay. So, coming on the next question, which of the following is a characteristic feature of Barrett esophagus? A characteristic feature of Barrett esophagus. Is it squamous metaplasia, intestinal metaplasia, columnar metaplasia or severe dysplasia? What is the correct answer? The correct answer is the columnar metaplasia. It's the columnar metaplasia. Okay. So, what is metaplasia? Let me explain you what is Barrett esophagus. For understanding Barrett esophagus, you have to understand metaplasia. What is the definition of metaplasia? Metaplasia means replacement of one type of epithelium with another. Now, in human body, we have two types of epithelium, squamous or columnar. If squamous converted to columnar or columnar converted to squamous, it is known as metaplasia. So, metaplasia are of two types. What are the two types of metaplasia? Metaplasia is of two types. What are the two types of metaplasia? Squamous metaplasia. One is squamous metaplasia. And second is columnar metaplasia. Squamous and columnar metaplasia. Right. In squamous metaplasia, the columnar epithelia converted to squamous. And in columnar metaplasia, the squamous get converted to columnar. So basically, you have to see what is finally formed. Here, finally, squamous is formed. That's why known as squamous metaplasia. And here, here finally, columnar is formed. That's why known as columnar metaplasia. That is the two type of the metaplasia. Right. So squamous metaplasia, initially columnar is there. And it get converted to squamous. Right. So, there are many examples. I am not explaining you the examples of this. The second type is the columnar metaplasia in which initially there is squamous and finally it gets converted to columnar. Right. So, Barrett esophagus will come here. Let me explain you what is Barrett esophagus. So, can you see the first diagram? In this diagram, can you see the esophagus? It is lined by blue lining. And can you see the stomach? It is lined by red color lining. So, what is this blue? What is this red? The blue lining is the squamous and the red one is the columnar. We all know normal healthy esophagus is lined by squamous and the stomach is lined by columnar. This is normal. We all know that. We all know that. But have you ever thought why God has given two different lining in two continuous organs? These two organs are continuous, no? So esophagus followed by stomach. The two organs are continuous. So this is esophagus, this is stomach, stomach and they are, con they are in continuity. Right? They are continuous to each other. So because the stomach have hydrochloric acid inside that. The stomach have hydrochloric acid Stomach secrete HCL, na? So, the columnar epithelia can bear the stress of the HCL, but the squamous cannot. So, you will say, ma'am, it's good. The God has given uh, columnar in the stomach and squamous in the esophagus. It's good. But sometimes what happens, now? Some people have reflux. It's a disease. It is known as GERD. What is GERD? Gastroesophageal reflux disease. Reflux. So, in reflux disease, what is happening? See, the acid is going into the esophagus again and again, the lower esophagus. So, lower esophagus is exposed to acid. So, I told you the squamous epithelia cannot bear that stress. 
So the epithelia in the lower esophagus is replaced. It is converted from squamous to columnar. See, it is red. From blue to red. So see the lower esophagus normally and see the normal esophagus, uh, lower esophagus here. So in the lower esophagus, not entire esophagus, only in lower esophagus, the lining is converted from columnar to squamous. So such a esophagus, such a esophagus, the lower segment of the esophagus in which the lining is replaced from the columnar to the squamous, it is known as Barrett esophagus. And it is a pre-malignant lesion, right? So initially metaplasia occurs, then dysplasia occurs and then finally anaplasia can occur. So it is a pre-malignant lesion. This is known as Barrett esophagus, right? So that is the Barrett esophagus we have learned. Now you can see the Barrett esophagus question you can solve. Now coming to the next question, the next question is in front of you. The presence of subepithelial humps on electron microscopy in a kidney biopsy is indicative of what? Which glomerulonephritis? Is it post-treptococcal glomerulonephritis? Chronic uh, glomerulonephritis, crescentric glomerulonephritis, or membranous glomerulopathy. What is the correct answer? The presence of the subepithelial humps. Subepithelial. So the only clue given to you is the subepithelial hump. Okay, subepithelial humps are there. So let me explain you the correct answer is the PSGN. Let me explain you everything about the PSGN. For explaining PSGN, I have to draw a diagram. So imagine this is a human being. I am drawing a diagram of a human being. Okay, this is a human being you can see here. Okay, these are the kidneys of the human being. These are the tonsils of this human. Okay, this, this human have a tonsillitis by a bacteria or the skin infection. The skin infection by a bacteria. The name of the bacteria is group A beta streptococcus bacteria. You will remember it's very common. The bacteria is moving from the tonsils or the skin to the blood. Bacteria is coming in the blood. Okay. From the blood, the bacteria is going in the kidney. In the kidney. In the kidney, we all know there is a filtration barrier. What is a filtration barrier? In the filtration barrier, in the center, there is a basement membrane. It is known as glomerular basement membrane. In the center, there is a basement membrane. On one side, there is endothelium. On one side, this is endothelium. On other side, there are podocytes. It's epithelium. Epithelium. I know, these are the podocytes. So basically, I told you the bacteria is causing tonsillitis. After that, it is coming in blood. From the blood, it is going in the kidney. In the kidney, it gets deposited over the podocytes. In the kidney, it gets deposited over the podocyte. Please mind my words, right? So you can see where does it is going in the kidney. In the kidney, it is going and depositing in the podocyte. It is known as planted antigen. Now what the body will do? Body will form up antibodies against the bacteria, right? The body will form antibody. Antibody will also go behind the bacteria. So, antibody will go piche piche behind behind of the bacteria. Wherever the bacteria will go, antibody will also go there. So, antibody will also go on the kidney. It will also enter the kidney. It will also deposit it over the podocyte and form antigen antibody complexes. So, here you can see the antigen antibody complexes are formed in the podocyte, in the epithelium, not in endothelium. So, the deposits are known as sub epithelial deposit. What is it known as? Sub epithelial and it will destroy the filtration barrier. It will lead to a glomerulonephritis and such glomerulonephritis is known as post-treptococcal glomerulonephritis. It is also known as acute proliferative glomerulonephritis, one and the same thing. So either you say APGN or you say PSGN, it's one and the same thing. So currently one of the option was PSGN, post-treptococcal glomerulonephritis was the answer, right? So correct answer here is PSGN or APGN. You got it? So that is the filtration barrier is destroyed. And here the lesions are sub-epithelial. Now these lesions are very enlarged in size. You know, it is known as lumpy, bumpy, dumpy, humpy deposits. The same thing is written in front of you. You can see the flow chart. The name of the bacteria is group A beta streptococcus bacteria. Okay, that is the name of the bacteria, right? The first bacteria I told you, it is causing tonsillitis or skin infection, right? After that, it is going in the blood. From the blood, it is going to the kidney, right? From the kidney, it is getting deposited on the podocyte. It is going in the filtration barrier. Now, antibodies are also formed. Antibodies are also behind behind. Antigen antibody complexes are formed in C2 against the planted antigen. So, subepithelial deposits are there and it is PSGN. You can see in the diagram also, these are the subepithelial deposits we are talking. These are the podocytes. On the podocytes, appreciate the red dots as the bacteria and appreciate the antibodies are also coming and forming a complex there, right? So basically, you have to learn uh, the classification of the renal diseases or glomerulonephritis according to the deposits. So four type of deposits are there. Let me tell you the four type of deposits. For this, I have to draw the filtration barrier again. You can see this is the basement membrane, glomerular basement membrane. You can see on one side, it's endothelium. This is the endothelium. On other side, it's visceral podocytes. 
these are the podocytes the visceral podocytes are there this is the other side the visceral podocytes are there on the other side now where and these are the mesangial cells what are mesangial cells mesangial cells are the supportive cells these are the mesangial cells now the deposits can have four location let me tell you the location of the deposit deposit can be in the basement membrane these are known as intramembranous deposit can be there on the endothelium endothelial layer these are known as sub endothelial deposits deposits can be on the podocytes that it was there in our question now psgn the deposits can be there these are known as sub epithelial deposits and deposits can be in the mesangium the supportive cells so these are the four locations now tell me in which glomerulonephritis which type of deposits are there i mean i mean to say where is in the basement membrane when is sub endothelium when is sub epithelium and when is mesangial so the chart is in front of you currently the question was on psgn which is sub epithelial now you can get question on any of them right so we will solve few more question from few more papers we have covered two papers till now we will cover one more paper okay so the next question which is a nephritic syndrome which of the following is nephritic syndrome so you must understand what is nephritic syndrome what is nephrotic syndrome you must have a understanding of that right so what is the correct answer is it minimal change disease membranous glomerulonephritis post streptococcal glomerulonephritis or focal segmental glomerulonephritis what is the correct answer yes the correct answer is post streptococcal glomerulonephritis it is the correct answer this is by mistake okay so let me explain you the nephritic and the nephrotic syndrome now nephritic syndrome and nephrotic syndrome are two syndromes these are not one diseases it is a syndrome nephritic syndrome and nephro tick syndrome right so please mind the spelling this one is itic this one is otic this is nephritic syndrome this one is nephrotic syndrome right now here a cluster of five a cluster of five symptoms occur and here a cluster of six symptoms occur so any kidney disease having these five symptoms is classified as nephritic and any kidney disease having a cluster of these six symptoms is known as nephrotic so let me explain you what is the cluster of symptoms let me start with nephritic in nephritic the patient have hematuria the patient will run to you doctor i am having blood in the urine my urine is red in color blood in urine that is known as hematuria sometimes it is microscopic not visible with the naked eye but microscopically it is visible number two patient will say doctor i am having protein in urine mean patient don't come to know that but if you do the urine analysis you will come to know the patient is having mild proteinuria also so blood in urine protein in urine if we measure the blood pressure of the patient the patient is hypertensive if you see the patient have edema also and patient have oliguria so uh, hematuria proteinuria hypertension edema and oliguria these are the five findings of nephritic syndrome right the examples are psgn you have to learn the examples psgn rpgn rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis right membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis right so these are the important examples you have to learn here among them most commonly it occurs in rpgn coming on nephrotic syndrome coming on nephrotic syndrome okay in nephrotic syndrome patient don't have hematuria there is no blood in urine patient directly have proteinuria it's massive and selective most of the albumin is lost since i am saying most of the albumin is lost in the urine it is known as hypoalbuminemia hypoalbuminemia there is edema also hyperlipidemia lipiduria and hypercoagulability so these two things regarding the lipid lipid is there access of lipid is there in the blood access of lipid is there in the urine right so these six symptoms are known as nephrotic syndrome you have to learn the examples most common cause in children is minimal change disease most common cause in adults is focal segmental glomerulosclerosis right so you have to learn that right so we can see nephritic syndrome nephritic syndrome the cluster of the symptoms you have to appreciate you have to learn coming on the next question can you tell me anti anti uh, uh, sedent diagnosis of group a streptococcal infection in a rheumatic fever we have already covered rheumatic fever i have not explain you this question you can directly give the answer what is the correct answer here is it aso is it crp is it esr level or is it so low s3 level low c3 level c3 is a complement yes the correct answer is the aso anti streptolysin o titer so let me tell you the jones criteria for the rheumatic fever i guess everyone can understand this i have already explained you this is a diagram of a child you can see this is a diagram of a child uh, the child is having tonsillitis by group a streptococcus bacteria the body is forming antibodies against that these antibodies are auto antibodies right these antibodies you can see these are auto antibodies right now the similar antigen that is am protein which is present on the bacterial cell wall the similar am protein is present on human five organ the brain the heart the skin the subcutaneous tissue and the joints 
So these auto auto antibodies start damaging the human five organs, causing five diseases. Right. So the five diseases is the five major criteria, and the umbrella of the five terms. The umbrella term is known as rheumatic fever. So the five major criteria is the heart. In the heart, there is carditis. I know. In the brain, it's syndam scoria. In the joints, it's arthritis. In the skin, it's erythema marginatum. And in the subcutaneous tissue, it's subcutaneous nodules. These are the five major criteria. Coming on five minor criteria, there is fever, there is arthralgia, right? Arthritis is a major criteria. Arthralgia is a minor criteria. Please understand. Itis is the inflammation in the joint. Arthralgia means pain in the joint. So inflammation in the joint is major criteria. It's migratory polyarthritis, itis, and arthralgia is a minor criteria. Now in the heart there is carditis now because of which the PR interval on the ECG will raise and ESR will be raised, right? These are the minor criteria. But everything is occurring after the streptococcal infection. How you will prove that? After the group A beta streptococcus infection, only everything is happening. I agree the bacteria is not causing the damage to the five organ. It's the autoantibodies, but autoantibodies will form only after the bacterial infection. So that is known as supportive criteria. Supportive. That was our question, the antecedent diagnosis. How you come to know that before having all this, the patient have a streptococcal infection, the throat infection. So there are three things. Either you do a throat swap or you look for the autoantibodies in the blood. So one of the antibodies is ASO, anti-streptolysin O. That is our answer right now. And one more antibodies are anti-DNA's antibodies are there. Anti-DNA's antibodies are there, right? Coming to the next question, can you tell me the most characteristic finding in the diabetic nephropathy? Most characteristic, not most common. So what is the correct answer? Is it KW kidney? By KW, I mean Kimmelston wilson kidney. Or is it diffuse glomerulonephritis? Or is it focal segmented glomerulonephritis? Or is it Armani Ibsen kidney? What is the correct answer? Yes, the correct answer is Kimmelston Wilson kidney. K W kidney. Kimmelston Wilson kidney. That is the correct answer. Now let me explain you everything regarding diabetic nephropathy. Now we know whenever a person have diabetes, diabetes mellitus. What do you mean by that? The person is having hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemia means the person have increased blood glucose sugar. Blood glucose levels are increased. That is hyperglycemia. There are two types of diabetes, type 1 and type 2. If the diabetes mellitus is managed, if it is treated, it is good. But if it is not treated now, it causes damage to three organs in future. Right? To kidney, to retina of the eye. Retina of the eye, number 2. And number 3, the nerves. The nerves, nephropathy. Okay? So this is known as diabetic. This is known as diabetic nephropathy. This is known as diabetic retinopathy. This is known as diabetic neuropathy, right? Currently, I am interested in diabetic nephropathy. So what happens in diabetic nephropathy? Three type of lesions occurs in patient. I will explain you all three lesions, okay? The first thing, the glomerulus is involved. Glomerulus sclerosis. There are two type of glomerulonephrosis. Both of them are in front of you, the diffuse and the nodular. Let me explain you the meaning of the diffuse and the nodular. Here in both of them, the hyaline get deposited. What is hyaline? Hyaline is a pink color, acellular, structureless material, right? It will get deposited. In diffuse also, in nodular also, okay? In diffuse, it will be deposited at four places. Number one, it is deposited in the mesangium, you can see. Number two, it is deposited in the capillary lining, in the capillary lining, in the basement membrane of the capillary, I mean. Number three, it is deposited at the capillary cap. It is looking like a capillary ne cap lagaya hai, topi, hai na? capillary cap. It's known as fibrin cap. And number four, it is deposited in the Bowman's capsule. In the Bowman's capsule. This is known as capsular drop. So what are the four places? Number one, I told you mesangial deposit. Number two, fibrin cap. Number two, thickening of the arteriole. I mean the GBM. And number four, capsular drop. That's why it is known as diffuse. The hyaline is deposited at four places. But come on the other one, the nodular one. Here also hyaline get deposited, but in the form of the circular nodules. Can you see? Nodule, 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 nodule. It is not everywhere. It is in the nodules. Now compare this and this. Here the hyaline is deposited diffusely. Here the hyaline is deposited nodularly. So this one is known as diffuse glomerulonephritis. This one is known as nodular glomerulonephritis, glomerulosclerosis. The nodular one is also known as Kimmelston wilson kidney. The other name given to the nodular. Now tell me which is more common? The more common, if I ask more common, answer is diffuse and if I ask more specific or more characteristic so more specific or more characteristic answer is nodular now have a look on your question what they are asking they are asking the characteristic finding of diabetic nephropathy so what is your answer specific or characteristic is Kimmelston uh, Wilson kidney KW kidney that is nodular ka dusra naam, the other name of the nodular but if I change the question from characteristic to common can you tell me the most common one so answer will change from Kimmelston uh, I mean KW kidney to diffuse 
So currently answer is A. But if I ask most common, so diffuse one is more common, and this one is more specific or more characteristic, right? The nodular one. The other name of the nodular one is Kimmelston Wilson kidney. Kimmelston Wilson kidney. Please learn that. Please learn. It's a very 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 frequently asked question. You got it. So that is the thing. Coming on the next question, most sensitive indicator for iron deficiency anemia. I guess everyone knows the answer. Is it ferritin, TIBC, percentage saturation, or bone marrow iron? Yes, you all know the answer. The correct answer is the ferritin. Because before falling everything else, the ferritin is the first thing which will fall. What is ferritin? Ferritin is the storage form of the iron. It is the storage form of the iron in the liver. So if I stop eating iron from today in my diet, so will I have anemia tomorrow or today only? No. For the next 2-3 months, I will not have iron deficiency anemia because in my liver, I am having the storage. The storage is in the form of the ferritin. So my liver will give the backup for hemoglobin for heme synthesis. So ferritin will go on falling, 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 falling. It is the most sensitive indicator, earliest indicator to fall. One time will come when ferritin will zero. At that time, the patient have less hemoglobin synthesis and that time the anemia will manifest. You got my point? So that is the thing. I hope you got it. So that's all about it. I hope I have covered many PYQs of FMG. Before ending, let me tell you something. Now you have only two options in your life currently at this phase of life. Either regret later or study now. The choice is yours. I have a lot of The choice is yours. You got my point? So, you know, abhi to me lag raha hai, the studying is sucking. You know, the whole day, the studying, the lectures, the subjects, you know, they are very lengthy. Sometimes you are very depressed. You are very down. You don't understand anything. You don't feel like doing anything, anything, anything. I can understand that feeling because we all have passed. I also passed from that feeling, right? Everyone have a phase in the life. This phase you are living right now, okay? But, uh, you know... Uh, this feeling suck the worst feeling in this world which you are having right now but there is more uh, another feeling which is more worse than that that regret the regret imagine you have results but uh, god says this doesn't happen and you don't didn't got a good rank you didn't got selection so how you feel that day that day you the, the, that day will be more sucking or this day is more sucking that day you will have regret that we have studied this is not our result so regret is more sucking more worse the worst feeling in the world is the regret so don't have the regret give your best shot study as much as possible do smart work complete your all 19 subjects after that give your best shot even if you are not selected after that you will not have regret that that that, that was my best uh, uh, the best shot i have not wasted my time you got my point wishing you all the best here i am ending if you like the session and if you want more such sessions we can conduct more such sessions for the fmg students for uh, pathology thank you so much wishing you all the best i wish Aap sabko bohut acha rank mile and once you get the rank I wish uh, you can connect me and you can tell me you can tell the team that you got selected and that's all. Thank you so much. Wishing you all the best. Bye bye.